We would be honored if you would join us. Ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? I always ask that of all my prey. Go ahead. Make my day. My name is Turk, and I'm here with my good buddy Raz. We bring you our thoughts and reactions to what's happening in pop culture today, and go back in time to revisit classic films of the 80s and 90s. Yes, indeed, we're back again, and we're feeling good. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, I'm feeling really super today. As in, like, you feel like a superhero? I do, especially today. Especially today. Why is that? Uh, maybe because uh, I watched a certain film that just lifted my spirits and now I, I feel like can, I can do anything. Yes. Well, that just takes us into our retro roundtable. Yes. And what are we talking about We're talking today? about Superman 1978. Yep. Directed by Richard Donner. The Again, late, another Richard Donner film. Another Richard Donner, the late great. Richard Donner. Yes. And it stars Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, Christopher Reeve. The Goat. The Goat. The Goat. And Margot Kidder. Yeah. So, one thing about Superman, Superman is one of those films, when you think of your childhood, you think of Superman. Even if you were a big fan of Superman, there's just certain movies, Star Wars, E.T., Superman, Back to the Future. When you think of these movies, it's always Superman comes up, wouldn't you say? Yep, I agree. And as I said in our previous podcast talking about Superman, my whole life has kind of been based with Superman involved some way or another. But you, on the other hand, you appreciated Superman, you watched it, but you weren't necessarily a Superman fan like myself. Correct. So when did you first discover this movie or when you watched it? Was it on your own? Was it with your siblings? Or was it... How did you first kind of experience this movie? Hmm. That's a tough one. I feel like I probably just watched it on my own at some time when it was maybe on TV when I was younger. Uh, this came out in 1978, so I was just, you know, probably getting out of diapers by then. But, um... <laughs> but uh i probably saw this by myself maybe when i was like i don't know i want to say around 10 11 years old maybe on television yeah yeah so much later in life yeah much later in life yeah. uh not until kind of more recent you've really got into the comic books yeah okay and then obviously what i talked about mine the superman was there i watched it rewatched it yeah you know so i've always you know appreciated superman like, I was at such a young age that I didn't know the difference between Christopher Reeve and Ashley Superman. I thought they were one in the same. Well, I mean, even me at like 10 years old, I, I would agree with that. I He was Superman to me, too. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe you're yeah. like, well, no, that's Superman. It's not Christopher that's Reeve. That's right. That's Superman is yeah. a real person, which yeah. is kind of funny. But anyways, this movie is like one of those movies with the music, the acting. It, it defines you know pop culture it does it so. does kudos to john williams because 
He he made that film just so special with his music. Amazing. He did. Uh, the music really adds that. Because I think even with the, the musical score, when it goes dun da da it's like Superman. I yeah. think that's actually was like a chorus. Could be. It's pretty yeah. cool. You can hear Superman. <laughs> so just just cool, but just like you look at Christopher Reeve, there, there's no one else on this earth that probably could have played him. No. Okay. Besides that, before we get right into the nitty gritty of Superman... Now watching it as a middle-aged adult, what is your experience like just watching it again? It was good. Like, I really enjoyed it. Obviously, some of the the technology in the film and the special effects don't age very well. But it's 1978, so uh, I'm obviously going to have to take a pass on it because I'm not going to criticize uh, the way they made films back then because they had very little to work with. But they did amazing things with what they had. D- and, uh, like, you know, like even with Star Wars, too, back in the day. But... Uh, but yeah, they they did such great stuff. Uh, nowadays, can you pick out the discrepancies? Of course you can. But of the time in 1978, I bet you it was just amazing filmmaking. And by the way, we watched the extended version of Superman. We did, so yeah. And which now, I don't think I could watch the, the old theatrical. And I, I can't believe they actually took out some of those scenes that they reinserted into the movie. Yeah. Well, it, I, I watched it, like, yeah, I watched the extended cut yesterday. And we were talking earlier, like, I, I couldn't believe that it was a three hour long movie. And you were asking me, like, did you think it felt long? But I didn't think it felt long. But at the same time... I was thinking, okay, I'm watching an extended cut. So I'm I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, what scenes did they cut out to make it a theatrical release? And I'm trying to like pinpoint as I'm watching it, I'm like, okay, maybe that scene could have got cut out. But I don't know because I, I have nothing to go bases. I can't base it, right? Like Where I really noticed the, the added stuff was actually in the beginning of the film with Krypton and the people there. There was some added scenes. Oh, man. And so, and I love that stuff because yeah. that's, to me, that's like, important world building it is and then yeah. there's a i believe well obviously when superman goes to the lair to find lex Luthor when he calls him with the the dog whistle before he would just go through the, the concrete yeah and he'd get to his lair and he'd be right there at the door where right. before he takes him through he shoot has guns shooting at him he has a flamethrower he has like a ice gauntlet machine. of stuff it's a gauntlet yeah. stuff which i can't believe it because it's awesome. so cool and it gets a, another way to showcase his invulnerability yes you're getting able mm-hmm. to see what superman is capable of and what he's mm-hmm. not that was awesome yes and just a quick little gauntlet yeah, 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 definitely. It's been good, like uh, like yourself. I haven't watched in a while, so to rewatch this movie, obviously, it's the product of its time, and it is dated in some stuff. Yeah. But in some ways, it's still it feels timeless. Yes, and that's what I really enjoyed about it. And the performances are still there, even there's some corny stuff. But I, I enjoy the hell of rewatching it. Me too. So, super excited to do this retro round table. <laughs> Okay, so you can imagine in 1978, the world was probably still reeling from the pop culture phenomena, Star Wars. And up until this point, Superman had never been featured in a big budget movie. He was still an icon who appeared in nearly every other medium, right? Like lunch kits, TV, cartoons, comics, like he was still there. You could imagine how much the movie had to live up when they decided to make the Superman movie, right? Yes. Like that's like at the time in 1978, that's 40 years of build up of Superman. Yep. And then now they're coming from right in the heels of Star Wars. Yep. <laughs> you can imagine like the pressure on this film. Mm-hmm. Warner Brothers probably knew this and it actually uh, took them two and a half years to actually cast Superman. That's uh, that's a long time. Almost as long as the whole production of the movie being made. Like pre-production, the right. post-production, and all that. Yeah. So, so you can imagine, they kind of knew. It's funny that Warner Brothers back then really took this serious. Now looking at Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they ended up finding the perfect Superman, Christopher Reeve. And just like Star Wars, the brilliance of Superman is they casted unknowns in the title roles. You know, you could not cast, you know, someone that we knew. And they considered casting Paul Newman, Steve McQueen. I think my dad would like Steve McQueen. What's dad doesn't like Steve McQueen? Robert Redford. Yeah. And would you believe it that Clint Eastwood was also offered the film? Can you imagine that? Yeah, that would have been interesting. Superman with a gun? Well, you're going to look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. Yeah. (laughs) And just kind of thinking about it at the time... 
Hollywood almost collapsed in the 60s because they went through flops because back then movies were like more so actor driven right and then if you watch 1970s movies they're very like depressing and dire you know they had a few hits in the 70s like the godfather and the exorcist yeah but it was very few and then when you want got to sci-fi and fantasies they were more like silly B movies with shitty special effects and crappy acting. They right? were hard to do. <laughs> so they were hard to do. Yeah. I mean, you had the odd uh, exception, like two thousand, a Space Odyssey, but those shows were like grim philosophical movies. Mm-hmm. You know, they're good, but you know, for like a kid and fun, they just they didn't do that. And that all changed in uh, nineteen seventy seven with a little independent movie, which we already mentioned. Yes, Star Wars. Yep. And with this, you as a movie goer, you know, can have fun again in the movies because that's what really Star Wars really did. I mean, you, I guess, Jaws had some fun elements. Jaws was probably a good one, yeah. But it was more like centered as a like a thriller horror comedy, True. right? True. You can think with Superman, the movie afforded audiences the perfect filling in to tie them over for the next chapter of Star Wars. I think that's what Superman did really well. Yeah. That. It came right after Star Wars. It was the perfect time for Superman to come out. Yep. Warner Brothers hired many. Actually, you know, they hired a lot of the people on their production. Obviously, with John Williams. Uh, they got him. And John Williams was fresh off Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And obviously, Star Wars. Yep. <laughs> it's easy to forget in the past before Superman that all superhero shows have been around as uh, almost as long as their counterparts. Like, there was those 1940s live action serials, like there was Captain Marvel, uh, there was Batman and Superman, and like I don't know if you you're familiar with these 1940s serials, but they were they were just awful. Like they were laughable. Uh, the costumes were <laughs> super baggy. Like they just the the you can tell the sets were made out of cardboard. And I know it's in the yeah. 1940s, but to watch it today, you're like, what the hell am I watching? And the plots were so ridiculous that they didn't resemble anything like you would get in the comics. So if you were a fan of the comics and you watched these shows, you'd be very disappointed. Because, yeah. like, I think I tried watching that George Reeves Superman, the 1950. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but we did get in the 1960s the Batman television show. And yeah. The- popular it was fun lots of bright colors in that show so i I could see where people could be enticed by watching that with all the bright Mm -hmm. costumes yeah it was it it had all kinds of stuff but it just didn't meet the mark for batman and let's be honest it was a goofy parody like get smart it was yeah it was so if you watch it now you would watch it for that goofy hammy nostalgia but to to watch it as a serious batman film you couldn't you'd, you'd be really left disappointed yeah but It would probably be at that time, like 1978, audiences expected Superman to be the same. I think if you look at kind of before all the production came together, I think people are like, oh, Superman is going to be like those cheesy shows like Batman. But we were in for a treat. Yeah. And the movie treats Superman serious. I think that's the biggest thing. To this day, watching Superman, I would say it still treats him serious. And I think that's the best thing about the movie is that it's like it believes that this guy actually exists. It's preposterous, right. but it, it takes it serious. And the character takes the stuff serious in yep. a fun, loving, adventure way. Mm-hmm. The movie treats Superman serious and the adventure feels far more grander than the audiences have seen before. All the superhero movies that has come after owes Richard Donner a huge thanks. Would yes. you say? Yes, they do. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, you can see in 1977 movies started. This is where, like, these movies, where movies started to catch up with fans' imaginations. Because I think that's why Star Wars and Superman, you know, excited people. Just look at the effects. Yes, they're dated, but they're still pretty good. They are still pretty good. Yeah, Yeah, like, they're pretty good. And you can imagine the audience back then, you're like, holy shit, a man can fly. And you can tell they pull out all the stops that they probably learned from Star Wars. You know, all kinds of combinations of mad effects, trickery with cameras. You can see that. Yep. They had complicated rigs and physical stunt work. And it makes you th- makes me think of The Matrix. Like, they probably, The Matrix probably pulled from what they did in Superman. Yeah. Actually, they had Christopher Reeves hanging up at times as high as 50 feet. Holy. 50 feet, man. Holy shit. And this was really highlighted in the marketing. 
And I remember this when you see the posters, especially if you look at how they're marketing, it, they, they just said, you'll believe a man could fly. You know, you did. They made you feel someone could fly and had yeah. this power. And they also they had other iconic stuff. But yeah. Okay. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of the film, why don't we uh, step into the uh, the DeLorean and we'll punch the coordinates to 1978. Yes. But more specifically, December 10th, 1978. All right. So let's fire it up and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Okay. Bring your capes. <laughs> Oh, damn, that ride was cold. My nipples are hard. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, eh? I told you. Well, we're, we went, we're, we were on a different planet, aren't we not? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, everything looks so crystally here. It's weird. Very crystally. Yeah. I, I like it. I do. I do. One thing I really like about this movie, it feels like three in one. So the first part is set in Krypton. Yeah. But before that, we have to mention the opening title. Yeah, which I really loved, and I, I I did not know this was even in there. I loved it though. Well, I like how they have it like in the theater, and the 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 drape opens up, and then you see this old kind of projection, and then it has the action comic, and then it has the date that uh, the first action comic for Superman yep. comic was released, and then it kind of takes you to the Daily Planet that sphere is turning, and then it takes you to the the is it the moon and then the sun, and it basically takes you all the way to Krypton and that's when you get the iconic theme from John Williams and it's just it builds yes like and watching it again probably a viewer today be like change the channel Marge because it's <laughs> they're so long yeah like so long and then you get the Marlon Brando the Gene Hackman and then Superman like you don't even have Christopher Reeve before the credit the, yeah. the Superman credits yeah like it's that's crazy like who's Superman <laughs> Yep. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love this opening theme and the credits is like one of my favorite. Just like Star Wars. To me, it's just as iconic. Yeah, I, I really, <clears throat> I believe it was a little girl that was flipping through the pages of the of the Superman comic, was it not? Yes. And, and, and they, yeah, and it's weird, like 1978 and you're like, yeah, little girls read comics too. And, and it's weird, like they, it's just today's day and age, they people act like they don't, but no, they like 100% do. Well, yeah, like you, you, and I just thought that was a really nice touch to to have that at the beginning, have a little girl uh, reading uh, some of the excerpts from the comic book. That I thought was it was, awesome. I thought it was cute, and it was it, it, it was kind of touching that there was yeah. a little girl that was reading it. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, that was great. And then we get all the way to Krypton, and we see this. It looks like it looks like Hoth. It's this crystalline kind of frozen planet, very futuristic. Yeah, which I really like, but. It's one thing. This is. I don't think this would be a planet. That, it looks like it's a harsh planet, and yeah. you, you see the red sun, yeah, as opposed versus our yellow sun. So right there, you see a contrast between the Kryptonians and the the Earthlings. Yeah, I like that. And then we we get right there, and it it's a um, almost like an amphitheater, and then you have. Of course, the one and only Marlon Brando, who's walking around three hey, individuals. Great. Yeah, and you know, uh, there's really something about this movie. Marlon Brando at the time was one of like one of the biggest stars because he's fresh from The Godfather, right? Won an Oscar for it, and then I think he was fresh from The Last Tango in Paris. Okay, a film that most people haven't seen, but yeah. it was kind of like a thriller, kind of almost erotic thriller. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it was a real coup uh, casting Marlon Brando because you think about it, he's only in the movie 20 minutes. Yep. And he got, like, paid $3 million for this film That's... for about two weeks worth of work. That's awesome. Like, he's, like, was the highest paid actor at that time. Uh, and, and the thing is, the best part of this, uh, Marlon Brando did not like to, and, and if you watch his performance in the film, you notice he looks down a lot. Marlon Brando did not like to memorize lines. That's right. Because part of his method acting was he wants it to be authentic, spontaneous, yep. or feel spontaneous. 
thing is. <laughs> yeah. So you'd see like when you get to the scene where uh, Cal Al is in the rocket ship, you see him. I guess they had the all around in the ship there. They had notes of his dialogue. Yes, and I, I I was looking up in IMDb some of the trivia and just mm-hmm. of that little scene there. I guess. They had notes written on the diaper of the baby. Yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome. Really, really good. And yeah. I think there's a, also part of the Krypton Council. But first, before we go there, uh, he you see these these faces in the background. It looks like this council. And he's talking to them. And he's kind of listing the crimes. And then we get introduced to General Zod and uh, Nam and Ursula. Yeah. And these are people she talks about their crimes. And... It's really something at the time they really in this film, we just see these three characters getting sent to the Phantom Zone and just like, okay, that's that. Does this kind of pay off in any way? Well, it does. It does. Because when they made, when they were making the film, they were shooting two films at once. Yes. And right. that was unheard of back in that time. Right. Like today, yeah. you know, they'll make a whole trilogy where they tell you how many films they're making or like the Matrix yeah. they filmed too. Like, not an uncommon thing. We're like the Lord yeah. of the Rings. They film three movies in one. Yeah. But sometimes studios don't know how the first film's going to react and whether or not they can afford the second film. Right? No. Like, so that was a yeah. big gamble. This was a huge gamble, Superman. Yeah. Like, it, it, I think uh, if this didn't work, uh, it might have been the end of Warner Brothers. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> but thank God it did. Yeah. So, cool. We, we get that little moment with uh, General Zod and... But of being guilty, guilty, and, and and I like the setup that it, you know, he threatens him that. You will bow down before me, Jor-El. I swear it. No matter that it takes an eternity, you will bow down before me. Both you, and then one day, your ass. I used to think when I was a kid, your ass, but it's like your your heirs. Oh, your heirs. Okay. You know, but as yeah, young, kids. I used to think your yeah. ass, your yeah. ass. I don't know, like what, but yeah. your heirs, which was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And then they get sent to, to the fam zone, and then this is where the extended scenes you see it, that are reinserted in the film, where it's a longer scene between Jorel talking to the Kryptonian councils, yeah. leadership, right? Okay, and it go it goes self, and it's a great scene. You you, you see their narcissism. You yes, know. and I really think that is important to the film. If that's one of the extended scenes, then mm-hmm. that's really too bad that it was in the theatrical. No. because I feel like that's like really important stuff. It, it was really important. <clears throat> stuff and it yeah. is kind of too bad but it's but it's great that it's reinserted into yeah. the film now and you yeah. get to get to watch it but it really highlights like because you have to remember these kryptonians are like light years ahead of like earthlings because when they talk about earth as they're primitive yes and we're there but this advanced society doomed by their own kind of ignorance that did them only jor yeah I, I mean so they're light years ahead of earthlings in technology, uh, but only Jarrell can see that the planet's going to explode, and the rest don't. Like I, I don't. Do they? Do they think that Jarrell is like one of these kind of crazy scientists, kind of like you know um, Doc Brown in, in Back to the Future? Do they think he's kind of a loopy dude, and they don't really think he's right in the head, or like why are they not understand like listening to him? Well, the thing is, I don't think so because they they kind of mention in the dialogue that you you know. Be reasonable, Jarrell. You are known to be a reasonable person, and he even right. himself highlights that. But part of it is that that female scientist kind of concurred with some of the scientific stuff that he was talking about. But she was saying that it was just going to shift orbit, and they're going to be fine. Mm. And the the doom and disaster is he's mistaken because you can imagine all these, you know, hers along others' opinions probably trump Jorel's, even how respected he is. But yeah. I didn't think that, no, he's no Doc Brown. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because I was just, like, trying to understand, like, why are they so against him coming up with an idea that, you know, Krypton could explode? Well, they're probably their belief in their own superiority. Yeah. Like, I think... It, it, yeah, it could just, be their weakness, yeah. That's as part yeah. of their weakness. It's, it's kind of like Anakin Skywalker's weakness yeah. in uh, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. You know, don't right. estimate my power. Uh, and they do. They underestimate Jorel's warnings, and yeah. you know. And then, and I thought this was another good scene. He kind of highlights that I'm not going to do anything. I will. I'm staying. I will not make a a panic. I won't get people friend in frenzy mode. But he still secretly makes the little ship, and it was good. And I like there was another part at a uh, deleted scene where they're kind of talking about him that they're like, oh, he's making something. 
and we, this some abnormal activity and they're going to go arrest him mm. thinking that, that you know uh he shouldn't be doing that right uh and, and and then we get to this great scene where marlon brando and his wife laura are talking and saying goodbye to their son and just the dialogue that he says is like you know i bestow all my knowledge and all my power onto you and there's like the line that it was that the father becomes the son and the son becomes the father like just great stuff it was a great speech i was really uh i was taken aback by it and i was it gave me chills and Mm -hmm. um i was just like so focused on the film at that point well in this movie and that's the thing is like we don't get to see superman actual christopher reeve almost pretty close to an hour into the film i think it's around 30 minutes actually or 30 minutes I, I looked at the clock when i saw christopher reeve i'm like 30 minutes 30 minutes <laughs> yeah yes but we do actually get introduced to him a lot sooner but i'll mention it yeah you might you probably know mm-hmm. what i'm talking about because you have to look at the brilliance of this movie that they really market the show with marlon brando and gene hackman as the the title and actually that where I stand corrected, it was Lex Luthor. Gene Hackman doesn't appear till actually an hour into the okay. film. Okay, yeah. Uh, but he, again, has a presence too. So you have these two great actors with this great presence. Every actor in this movie, this is one of the things I really liked about it, whether it was like a supporting cast or not, actually had a great presence. Like uh, Jackie Cooper as uh, Perry White, who actually is a little rascal, if you didn't oh, know. No way. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh-huh. Nice. But anyways... So Jorel and them say goodbye to their son, and then he goes, and we see this great scene of destruction, and you see like these people in their impending doom, which it was pretty horrific. Yeah. Um. When Jorel said, "Neither I or my wife will leave Krypton," and then the music started, and I just that's that's just gave me so many chills watching it. Oh yeah, the hair was standing up on mm-hmm. my arms, and yeah, it was just so beautiful. This movie uh, is just full of giving you goosebumps. And yeah. Like, this is just a nostalgia feel movie. This is so great about it. But so, little Kal-El is flying through space and time. He's hearing his father. And I like the how he imparts all his wisdom. He's talking about the galaxies. He's he's teaching his son. Yeah, as, as he's, he's like, flying through space. Yeah. And he's growing up. Like, how yeah. how many years did he spend in that pod? Do you want to say, like, four or five, maybe? Yeah, you can say a good four or five. Three, I think it's three years minimum. For him to get from yeah. Krypton to there. Right. And, but he kind of explains it in The Fortress of Solitude. That it, by then, he would have been thousands of years right. dead. Yes. Which is I th- is very cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Watch uh, Interstellar, uh, anyone, and they'll, <laughs> they'll kind of uh, answer that for you, what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, but then he crashes, and this is where the movie goes into, like, like I say, like the second movie where we get the Smallville bit. Yeah, like we're on a different world again. Yeah. Yeah. And a really good scene, and this just shows you the actors, Henry Ford that plays Pa Kent, they have little screen time and little to do, but their impact is so important. So he crash lands, they find this little kid, comes out of it, butt naked, you see Superman's wiener. Yeah. That's the one thing about this. This movie, yeah. you, I don't think you would do that again today. No, showing like a little kid's dick. No, they would. They would put something in front of them so <laughs> yeah, that you wouldn't really see it. But like legit, him, but you see yeah. all of Cal El. Yeah, you see, is like, oh my god, he wasn't. You know, <laughs> and, and the irony is, is that he wore a cod piece because that was like one of the things they talked about with Superman that, that Superman would have a super wiener. <laughs> Like well, this is, you can imagine in the storyboard meetings, yeah. um, you got all the heads of the studio. You have Richard Donner, you got Mario Puzo, and which I should say, I kind of we kind of glossed over. Mario Puzo wrote the story of Superman, and I think that's why okay. it's so good. Yeah, because this is the author of The Godfather. My big bro loves The Godfather, right? And he loves Mario Puzo, so and I think that's why he always says like comic book movies don't stand the test of time like Superman because it didn't have a writer such as Mario okay. Puzo okay. which I thought that was crazy you got <clears throat> Mario Puzo is writing Superman movie that's unheard of Marlon Brando Gene Hackman that's true man that's true it's crazy these guys don't belong in this no. film but yet they but pull it off so right. well like I mean yeah. Marlon Brando's jor the white hair the curl then you have his uh, Superman so the, the call sign his symbol that he wears and then yeah. you see all the Kryptonians have the symbol yeah but back to smallville they come they see them and obviously you learn when they're changing the tire and you learn right away pa kent has a heart condition yes and then you learn that they never had a kid and they're kind of figuring out and then 
we see why this kid is special. Uh, he, I thought it was funny here, like when Ma was like advocating, well, you know, I could just say he's my aunt's you know, child and stuff. And, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, we'll just steal this child and pretend he's ours. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, it was kind of funny, but, you know, I get it. And we'll just pretend that uh, this meteorite is nothing. Uh, yeah, and exactly. Well, what I want to know is, like, how did he get the, the little craft back to the farm? Well, I, I would have to say he probably whipped up a tractor and pulled it. I don't know. I, I don't guess know. so, but... I guess. Who I knows? Guess. <laughs> Who knows, man? Who knows? <laughs> you have to kind of let that go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we kind of get to when he's a teenager uh, at high school. That's where we kind of, the movie kind of takes us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so he's, he's well dressed. He's, he's dressed proper mm -hmm. and he's, you know, tidying up and cleaning. He's like the manager of the football team. He is, but we learn that he kind of resents that because he actually should be on the team. Oh, yeah. would anybody be able to stop him? I know, and I, I, I'm wondering, we never got a scene, but I'm wondering yeah. if that was, like, the, the talk with uh, Kent and him that... Paul Kent, yeah. Because, like, you kind of see this done a little more fleshed out in The Man of Steel. Okay, so he's there cleaning up, and then we get a, a, a cute little scene with him and Lana Lang. Yes. And he's going to help her out, and she invites him to uh, listen to some records, which, yes. which is really interesting, like, in this movie. It's very timeless, because you have these old vintage cars that... Could be out of the 50s or yep. 60s. Yep. Uh, and it makes kind of sense if you think about the timeline when the movie does it. Well, yeah, I guess that would be. But it's very timeless yep. kind of. Uh, I like it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. So she wanted to, you know, listen to some music with soups. But old Brad comes in there and tells mm -hmm. him he's got to pick up the jock straps. <laughs> 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 and yeah. they take off and yeah so we got a bully here we got a bully yeah. well he's more of a, a jock jo i don't I know yeah. yeah yeah he's just establishing his dominance over clark there and he's trying to take out yeah. take the girl away and clark him. has to kind of take it because yeah. if he doesn't or he risks kind of revealing his special powers yeah and then he kicks the the football into the atmosphere pretty much that's that that cool yeah i yeah. like that then it takes us to the the famous train scene when he's running along it. Yeah, now this is where I was kind of giggling Ugh. because it's like I said, the, the special effects don't hold up here. And just the way he's running looks so weird. It looked really weird, <laughs> but if I'm a teenager in 1978 watching this, I'm probably thinking, well, that's cool. You know, so you, you got to keep, you got to pretend that you're in the time like we are now and just kind of visualize like, yeah, okay, I get it. Like that's all they had to work with, mm -hmm. really. So it's fine. Um, doesn't look bad today. Yeah, it kind of looks bad today, but uh, I'm like, I let it go because it's yeah. 1978, man, and it's it's uh, it's a special piece of uh, film, and that ties back to the, the old saying, you know, faster than a locomotive, just to kind of let you know that his powers have continuously are growing. Yeah, and it's it, it is a fun scene. Like, yes, outside of the effects and all that, still a fun scene. I still enjoyed it with the music and him enjoying it running and then with an the extended cut you get kind of more of the scene where you see this young girl with these two these two people sitting in the train yeah because in the theatrical you don't really see it it's not fleshed out there's no dialogue you just see this girl watching this guy running and yeah. she points it out but a little bit of uh trivia and you might know this that the two adults that that girl is sitting with the the guy was the guy that played superman in the serial oh no i did not know that yeah, and then, and then the the lady, the mom or the grandma is played Lois Lane. Oh, Lois, okay. And then the little girl is supposed to be Lois Lane. Oh, nice. That's so right. She calls yeah, her yeah, Lois. She called her Lois. That's right. She does, which is kind of so. Superman is eighteen at that time. And yeah. How old did you say that girl is? So there's an age. Seven, difference. eight. Seven, eight. The irony of that is actually Margot Kidder is quite a bit older than Christopher Reeve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can tell she looks older than him. Yes. She still looks good. Uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it takes him to the scene where he's kind of the kids. Uh, he beats them home and yeah, the 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 guy's like, "How'd you get here so fast?" Uh, I ran. <laughs> oh, let's get out of here. This guy's weird. <laughs> yeah, but Lana, she looks like she's just like got that smirk. She's like wanted to stay, and yes. I wanted her to stay too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Pa Kent overhears it, and oh yeah, this is this is such a great, great it's a scene, heart touching film. scene. It where, is, you know, he kind of it kind of basically teach you know talks about responsibility, talks about why he's there, and you, right in that little scene, you see the love 
between uh, Clark and Jonathan. You know me. Some of the stuff that I love about Superman is that comes out of his relationship with the Kents. Like, I understand there's jor and he has a special... Yes. With his, that's his real father. But yeah. these adopted parents, I thought the movie captured that love really good as much as the screen time is so little with they did. Jonathan. Yep. And they have this heartwarming scene, but then, of course, uh, tragedy happens for Superman, which was actually a really good moment for a character such as that. Yes. This scene, um, I really like that, that Jonathan Kent was... Kept reminding Clark, like, listen, we need to keep you, we need to keep you grounded. You're not here to kick footballs. Like, you're yeah. not here. You're here for a different reason with mm-hmm. your abilities. You're not here to kick footballs or play football. Yeah. Like, and I and I like that that speech that he said to him because he realizes like you're here for bigger things, man. You're not yeah. you're not here for this little football stuff. I know you want to go out there and play and you want to show people, but you need to hold this in just a little bit longer because you will be special one day, you know. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. And then after the heartwarming talk, and then Pa can't just can't his old heart they, can't. They gotta take it. Richard yeah. Donner and have to take it away from. Yeah, us. and yeah. his old heart can't take it anymore, and. And Clark is like, come on, Dad, I'll race you to the barn. And so he races him. And, of course, Jonathan is lagging behind. And Clark makes it to the barn. And, and this time this, you see Jonathan collapse in the driveway. And Ma, Ma there sees him and yells out. And it's just, it's too late. Well, uh, Richard Donner said in the audio commentary that him grabbing his arm and stuff, that was actually was like ad-libbed by uh, Glenn Ford there. Right. Because he's like, you know, he, he well, that's what one would normally do, I think, in the case of a heart attack, is your left side yeah, kind of gets side. painful, it gets painful, yeah, and then it goes, it shoots down your arm, and I think yeah. that's what he was grabbing for. And also, up until that point, Jonathan Kent never was depicted dying. So, Superman the movie was the first time Jonathan Kent was depicted in dying in Superman, and now every iteration of superman in the movies and comics always has something that ties to jonathan kent dying yeah uh so yeah Yeah. owe it all to mario puzo we have to yeah it's a good way for superman to feel powerless it was kind of like the anakin skywalker and shmi his mom yeah he couldn't save her and this is another thing that i have all this power but i couldn't save him yeah as much as it's a tragedy in his life it's also a, a motivator for him to be the person who he becomes yeah and the thing is, then uh, we have the funeral, and we have these iconic shots. And I believe, like a lot of this movie was filmed in Alberta. Canada. Okay, cool. If you you look at the production, if you watch the, <laughs> the I mean, credits. I don't know what Kansas looks BC, like, but I, I would assume that Kansas would kind of look like that. And I thought they were yeah. just actually shooting in Kansas, but yeah. okay. Yeah, no, I think a, a lot of the the movie was shot in uh, actually Canada. Okay, cool. Uh, it's cheaper. I mean, right? we do have a lot of prairie <laughs> out here. We, we do, and yeah. a good scene at the at the funeral, and then. Uh, she wakes up in the morning, and, and he's out there in the field staring at the sunrise, and he's got to go. And he does, before that, when he wakes up, the, the crystal, the green crystal from his ship is calling at him. It's speaking to him. Yes. He hears something, and he goes, and he finds it. It's in the barn, right? It's in the barn. Yeah. And he gets it, and then he realizes, I got to go. A really good scene. I like the crystal thing, like the advanced yeah. technology of the crystals. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, like it, they look so delicate, but it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a good way to really separate yourself from the mm-hmm. real world to his mm-hmm. world. It is a great way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then he goes north, leaves his mom, and uh, heads north. I don't know how far north, but pretty far. Yeah, north. he looked like he went to the Rockies. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in British Columbia. Yeah, he maybe. went to British Columbia. That's that's no, for, for a lot of Americans that might be far enough north. Yeah, they would enough. like to go. Yeah, <laughs> we kid. We love our American <laughs> audience. And yeah, and then he he finds the spot, throws the. And the thing is, is it just intuition? Because this is always something that you don't know if there's like a voice in his head. Why why does he just throw it into the water or into the ice water yeah that i that i don't know i I didn't even know he knew where he was going like i I was just like dude okay so you figured out where north was you just Mm -hmm. trucked on north and decided ah, i've had enough i'm just gonna throw it here (laughs) like i don't know yeah he's just like okay this is it yeah see what happens (laughs) yeah (laughs) fingers crossed fingers crossed that's right (laughs) so but the the young man that played the young 18 year old clark kent the voice it was dubbed over that's christopher Ree's voice Okay. That's why he sounds so much because when you listen to it, you're like, man, he's got a real mature voice. You know, you and, know, and actually, I think they did a good job of casting the young Clark because yeah. 
I was not just because because the hair is easy to do, but when you're looking at his eyes, I was focusing on his eyes, and I'm like, you know what, his eyes are a really good match to Christopher Reeve's eyes, and I feel like that was maybe what drew them to cast him as a young Christopher Reeve. I think so. I he, the eyes, yeah. He did really good as a, a young yep. Clark Kent, uh, that actor. So kudos to him. Yep. And then we have this great crystalline structure grows out of the water and the force of solitude because i don't know up until that point it was depicted like that like this this movie kind of uh innovated a lot of stuff for superman Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways like the about the 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 crystal fortresses of solitude and how it rises up from the the ocean or the ground or whatever you want to call it i did notice that this is one thing about this film and what extends the film so long is there's so much b-roll in this movie and if if, for those people who don't know what b-roll is it's it's footage that supports the film so you won't see any major actors or people in this in this footage it's mostly about the landscape the buildings it shows you where you are it shows you where you're possibly going b-roll is important for a film but what i found with this um this film is that there is a lot of b-roll like a lot and don't Mm. get me wrong i like it i love b-roll especially for someone who's made some like short little videos myself based on b-roll so uh i really do appreciate it and uh so when you're seeing the rising of the fortress of solitude and you're seeing these long crystal pillars come like out on different angles and they're shooting up but it's very slow and they cut to like 50 different ways of of seeing these crystal pillars coming up and i was like holy shit like how many more times are we going to see these pit these crystal pillars shooting up right it's like yeah okay that's enough it's enough so sometimes it's a little overdone but i understand what they're doing there and they're just trying to show you the the size difference and how big the fortress really is yeah and also like how isolated where the fortress is it's at a place that uh humans can't really inhabit yeah and you, you when he was walking inside it you see how only like a person like superman probably could kind of like interact live in this thing or be in there because it's it's not it doesn't look like a real comfortable place it's not inviting it's not inviting <laughs> no. it's no it's not the four seasons <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah, but no, uh, I, I still love it. I, I thought it was great. It was oh, it great. was great. And yeah. then uh, just uh, you get that moment where he takes that one crystal, puts it in, and it it opens up his interaction with, you know, Marlon Brando. And I, I love this, the AI where intelligence, you know, like it's he's not really there, but he is interacting with him. Yeah. And about this film, uh, with when he takes it out of his backpack, it was kind of nice to see that little... That little earthly thing that that reminds me of my childhood is having that old fashioned canvas backpack in school. Yeah. I used to have one just like it. So when he pulls his crystal out of there, I'm like, oh, that backpack! I had one of those. Like it was awesome. And the plaid uh, coat he wore, <laughs> yeah. just vintage, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It it was good. And then he he has this great uh, conversation with uh, his dead father, uh, Jarrell, and he kind of, and right there in a couple of sentences, uh, the. Jorel kind of you, you kind of know what's going on he he tells Clark everything he kind of needs to know and also to the audience that he unveils that yeah. now he knows you're my son you're from this and he kind of takes him and I, I like how it takes us on a journey like he takes him into space it's either figuratively or literally mm-hmm. he goes and he explains stuff to him and you can tell they kind of loop over but it took him 12 years like with this teachings with Jorel before he kind of came back Mm -hmm. the one thing the movie doesn't really explain when he does come back and and just before that i like some of the lines that they can be a great people color they wish to be they only lack the light to show the way for this reason above all their capacity for good i have sent them you and you show them the way and that's such an iconic you know those words like it's just mario puzo and the way marlon Mm. brando delivers it i just i I think talking right now i'm getting goosebumps yeah it's great writing it really is it's great writing (laughs) 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 uh great right and then so 12 years he's went on this journey with his you know artificial intelligence father at the force of solitude but the one thing, though, is that you see this, you know, he's standing from afar and they play the iconic music and he flies away. Yeah. They don't really explain why he has the suit. No, why he's wearing, they don't. Because in a scene later in the film, he's having a conversation with jor and he's like, so you you revealed yourself. That's why it kind of didn't make sense to me watching mm. it again. But I don't care. It's a cool shot. 
Yeah, one one can say that that Jarrell like left him the suit, I guess, or somewhere because you know in the beginning of the film you see Jarrell with that symbol where right, so maybe he just automatically like had the suit in an adult size suit. I don't know. It, it's it's hard to. Yeah, I mean, there's no point. Who knows? On it. Just yeah. let, let go. It's a cool suit. Okay, it's let iconic. It go. Let it go. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. Yeah, because like at least Man of Steel kind of, you kind of get an explanation for it. They really yeah. tried. Or this one, it's like, yeah, fuck it. He looks good in it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And and then this is where we get kind of introduced to Christopher Reeve at the Daily Planet. And like you said, the B-roll, we get the shots of this Metropolis. Metropolis, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's awesome. I do like it. This, this is one of my favorite parts of the B-roll is they're showing basically New York City, but... You're seeing the built. You're seeing the. Well, you get to see the twin towers in these shots, um, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's enough. odd. It's odd. It's to odd to see towers. it out there, but uh, yeah. So you see the twin towers, and they bring you down into the street level, and you see the hot dog vendors, you see the magazine mm-hmm. and the newspaper stands, and then you see the front of the Daily Planet. So mm-hmm. this this is it, what B roll does for a film is it takes you on a journey to where you need to go. Mm-hmm. I like it. And then you get this nice shot of the Daily Planet, and, and it's from the lens of Jimmy Olsen, where he's yeah. taking snapshots of his his co-workers and then you get a nice little frame of lois lane where his smile and she flips the hair back and you, you gotta say with margot kidder Ooh, and, uh, she looks good she looks good like i found her sexy but like i liked her energy like this is one yeah. thing like I, I don't think subsequent films or um iterations of lois lane has really captured i like amy adams but i thought she was miscast as lois lane yeah you know what you're right after seeing this you know yeah Yeah. with her i like her spunk because like lois lane is not only she drop dead gorgeous she has like she has a fiery kind of uh spunk to her and she's a personality she's like i'm gonna get it i'm gonna do it no one's gonna stop me and and that's what i love about lois lane because i think sometimes it's easy to kind of um you know, kind of downplay Lois Lane because you have these characters like Wonder Woman and, you know, alongside. But, you know, remember, like I said in other podcasts, Superman chose a, a female human and it takes a strong woman and person like Lois Lane to kind of meet at Superman's level. And Lois Lane, you know, I, I, and I think Margot Kidder actually captures that in this film. He did a wonderful job. A wonderful job. And then we get introduced to... Uh, uh, Perry White. I love Jackie Cooper as Perry White. I, I forgot, you know, he's great. He has that authority, that father figure. He's got the cigar. <laughs> and he's like, let me tell you, you know, in 1922, yeah. when I, you know, like he's he's done it all. And then we get, in, and this is the brilliance we get introduced to Christopher Reeves as Clark. Clark Kent. The, the brilliance of Christopher Reeve is how he played the same character, but they felt like two characters, like how he plays this big old Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This this guy like hunched over and kind yep. of you know kind of like you can walk over him and you see like because you look at this guy. He's this big six foot five guy, good looking guy. Lois Lane doesn't even like give him two two seconds of a look. Yeah, like she could care less about this guy. You know, the whole time in the interview, right? And then I like the scene where he's trying to open up the bottle and. Clark, you know, a Superman, he's <laughs> struggling. I don't know, this is great. Yeah. And it sprays all over, and then they kind of have a talk, and then sends him to his desk, and that's his first day. Really. Yeah, Not much, much there. Not much there. Nope. Yeah, that's that's really it. You could tell uh, Clark has uh, attraction to this Lois Lane right off the bat. You can see, you know, like when they sit down at their cubicle, he's kind of staring at her. She looks. and then, But one thing about the Lois Lane character, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner, but she can't spell worth a shit. That's right. She's always being corrected on what? how to spell. Yeah, like I, like <laughs> rapist. How many? Yeah, there's only teams. one P in rapist. Yeah. <laughs> so she spelt rapist. Yeah, rapist. Like holy shit. Like th- this is like you know I don't know why it's a gag in there. I love it though. It's cute. It's kind of cute. cute because yeah. like the character is such a presence. Yeah. It's it's kind of too bad like what kind of happened to Margot after with her substance abuse because oh. she she was like you know she I thought she was quite stunning in this film I thought you know, and her personality but when you see in like Superman three and four you can just see that uh, substance abuse and other things kind of took its toll on her kind of like Carrie Fisher she kind of had the yeah you know Hollywood act, you know you just you feel so bad because it's just such a great talent yeah, yeah. and then uh, we kind of get there where Clark is trying to. At the planet, trying to make plans for dinner with Lois Lane, but she's going to go uh, meet Air Force One. 
Yes. And but and I, I just like how he's like following her. <laughs> like a lost puppy. Like a lost puppy and then in the change room and, and then she <laughs> closes it on him and <laughs> Yeah, like this this kind of reminds me of the scene in the lake house when Keanu Reeves is walking away from that Mona chick. You know, he wants nothing to do with her. Yeah. This is kind of like the, the reverse. It's, it's kind of the reverse. Yeah, like she's like, hey, Clark, get lost, Clark. You know, like I'm busy well, here. But, like, but yeah. she's not, not like she's, but I don't think she's as dismissive to Clark as no, not he as is in the lake house. But right. She's like, you know, she, you could tell she still like likes Clark and respects him, but He's not the type of guy that drives, you know, gets her engines running. No, he, and, he's very clumsy. He's clumsy, yeah. self-assured. Yeah. Because you, you see Lois Lane is very self-assured. Like, she she even tells him, uh, my sister has two kids or whatever and a mortgage. That's not for me. I like where the action is. Because, like, he even says, don't you ever, like, stop? And she's <laughs> like, why would I? Yeah. You know, but she, the only time you see her kind of take notice is when he tells Perry White to send half a salary to... Uh, his mom owned Smallville, and she's like, huh. So that's the only time in the beginning of their first yeah. in, in, initial interaction, she does take stock on kind of Clark. But after that, he's just this co-worker kind of doofus. Yeah, because like, and before before that, she says the line, oh, and I bet you you have a gray-haired mother you're going to send your check to or whatever. And he goes, actually, she's silver-haired. Silver-haired. Yeah, so I like that. Though. And she's like, oh. Yeah. And I think we <laughs> yeah. glossed over the scene where they, I think it's his first day, and he tells her it's swell, and then they get that mugger. Yes. I We, we almost missed that one, but that, we have to because that get that scene gets echoed in Wonder Woman. Right, and I think draws right, 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 inspiration right. from that, but it, I, it just doesn't have the impact that the one in Superman doesn't. Hey, I just like how he's like, "Hey, psst, psst. and it goes, <laughs> yeah, come, come here, come here," <laughs> and she's like, "We better run away." And he's like, "We better go." So they, they follow this guy, yeah, and then <laughs> and you, you see he's. I just love how he plays it that he's like this coward of a person, like this big man, and he's trying to talk him about societies, and he's like, "You know what? You're right." And then he's like, give me your purse. And then Lois drops her purse. And then she kicks the guy when he's picking it up and he shoots. Yeah. He grabs the bullet and then he plays, he faints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, Clark, what are you doing? And, you know, he looks in his hand and you see the bullet in his hand. He's like, yeah. I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. And I just like how he's like, really? Like, you know, you risk your life for a couple dollars and some like bubble gum. And lipstick or whatever. Lipstick he's and... like, how'd you do that? And he's like, what? You just described everything yeah. in my purse. Huh, lucky yeah. guess. Yeah, that was good. That, yeah. that was a good scene. I, 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 I almost forgot about that one. But yeah. That, you have to talk about that one. Yeah. Okay, so we, we get into this scene where you see this uh, slightly overweight guy and he's, he's walking down the street and he's got a ton of confidence and he's kind of bumbling around and he's always putting food in his mouth and he's always eating and he's... Two detectives in in the uh, cop car here, are, like l watching him. They're obviously tailing him for some reason. They're they're talking and they're like, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna make a move on him." And and the driver picks up. He's got this car phone, but it's like a real handset telephone, like the old fashioned telephone with the with the little spirally cord. But I don't see what it's connected to at this point. So he's like, "Yeah, we're we're gonna get him. We're gonna get, you know we need backup." And then he just puts the phone down on his lap. And I'm like, man, was that even like a real phone? Like, I don't know. How did you get that in there? Hey, at least they attempted to have a phone and he's communicating. Yeah. You watch Avengers. They they, they don't have earpieces, but they're all talking to each other in different areas of the city. Yeah, so that's true. I know. Yeah. It, they did it better in 1978. That's true. That's true. But it was funny. It was funny. But, it is funny. You're so, like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're following this guy. And, and what I really enjoyed every time Otis was on screen is you heard this really happy, frumpy tuba play in the background with the music was just brilliant because, you know, that tuba was that character of Otis. He was, like, frumpy and eating all the time and goofy looking and always messing up and just a perfect music for him. And the facial expressions he makes, like <laughs> Ned Betty, like, it was just, like, it was, like, a role he was born for. Yeah. And then if you, you, you ever see him talk and stuff, he's far from that stupid. But he's, <laughs> yeah. he's at the time... This is a character, because you always wonder to yourself, why does a guy like Lex Luthor, like a criminal mastermind that he self-proclaims over and over in the movie, why does he have someone this as one of his henchmen who's unreliable, dumb as mud, and all he does is eat? Because it makes Luthor feel good. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> or those are the only people that would stand him. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But it's a good scene. He's walking and he's, he's like, like you, 
like you said, most of the time he's either chewing or eating something. Yes. Kind of like uh, if you pay attention in Brad Pitt movies, he eats a lot in his films. Okay. He's always like eating. Like if you watch the Oceans 11 and 12, that's okay. all he does is eat. <laughs> but anyways, that, that yeah. is this uh, Otis. Yeah. And he goes and he, that he gets that paper from the, the blind guy and the, He's, he's trying to take something and the dog... And, yeah, the dog starts barking. He's like, okay, okay, I'll pay for yeah. it. I'll pay for it. Yeah. And, and yeah. then it goes into the, the kind of the subway tunnel. Yeah. It's a cool it's a cool kind of setup where these cops are tailing him, like you said. With yeah, the, and he's always looking behind him. He's always. Always, always looking behind him. Yeah. And then he goes there and he's just standing. We get to the lair, the secret lair of... Lex Luthor's Lex lair. Luthor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I really, I really, and his layer is kick ass. I'll tell you, mm-hmm. this is a really cool layer. He's got like a library that he needs a ladder to access all these books from, mm-hmm. all these encyclopedias and whatnot. And he's got a swimming pool. Oh. He's got like a makeup beach there where they lay. Oh my god! Like what a cool layer. It is really cool, and he doesn't really pay anything for it. No, no. <laughs> it's just like, but the thing is, you figure the city, they, they, you know, with like the power gen, like the power and yeah. energy that he's. Uh, they would notice it. Like this empty room in the subway yeah. system is not being it. used by the city and they don't ever go check it's on it. Nice, yeah. like the electric bill. <laughs> yeah. Like, ah. yeah, he's got all these booby yeah. traps set up outside. <laughs> <laughs> so holy shit, man, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of like, activity in this uh, one area in the subway. Yeah. Uh, and you, you the, the, what's this movie captures and what Gene Hackman does really well, he can play evil but almost like lovable, funny, and sadistic at the same time, because that's what this Lex Luthor is. Like he's, you know, he's he's comical, but he's also very sadistic. Because like just like how he, you know, he pushes the door that uh, pushes the the detective out into the, the the subway train. Yeah, when he was trying to tail Otis there, and yeah. he couldn't quite get as far as he did. And yeah, the booby trap was to push the door even, mm. so he had no room to hide from oncoming train. Yeah, and then it just pushes him right out on. Yes, it. yes. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And then yeah. he, he's he's kind of admiring himself, and you see all those gadgets, like you know his keys and his buttons. And yeah, like, oh. you know, I wonder, especially with that now, just thinking about it, I wonder if there's a little bit of Doctor Claw, like. Well, you, yeah. you think like maybe something well, an this evil before, guy with buttons to push well maybe this is where they got the Dr. Claw idea because this kind was of, before kind of yeah. like Lex Luthor evil mastermind Dr. Claw yeah. was an evil mastermind I kind of see the similarities yeah, there yeah I see what you're bit. saying yeah but apparently uh, one of the contentions of Gene Hackman he had they wanted him to be bald as Lex Luthor is usually depicted as bald in comics TV shows and they wanted him to be, but he refused to cut his hair or shave his hair. And he even had a mustache, and he was refusing that. But eventually, I know about this one, but go ahead. But eventually, Richard Garner was like, okay, you don't have to shave your head, but you got to shave your mustache. So he, he compromised. And they found a kind of a, a different way where he looked like he had different hairstyles and wigs. Yes. So, and at the end, he had the ball cap. So. Well, actually, yeah. Okay, so that's really good. And and the trivia thing that I read, now, I'm, I don't know if these are 100% accurate. It's hard to tell. But it's it was on the IMDb DB website, so I'm just going by that. The idea that he's like, okay, you got to shave your mustache. And he was like, well, I don't really want to. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what. I'll shave mine if you shave yours. Now, at the time, Richard Donner didn't have a mustache, but he put on a fake one. Yeah. And then he just ripped it off. Yeah. <laughs> well, so well, that's funny. And it shows you, like, what a powerhouse Richard Donner is because he had Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman. And actually, uh, what Marlon Brando would do, uh, he would actually, like, kind of play games on, like, director. Like, he would – it was kind of more like – he would see what he can get away with. So when he was talking to Richard Donner about the character of uh, Jor-El, he'd be like, well, I want to be like a bagel. You want the character to look like a bagel and you act like he's this bagel. That's <laughs> and, and, and just to see what Richard Donner and like, I guess Richard Donner's like, no, we're not doing that. And if you kind of listen to Marlon Brando when he says Krypton, Krypton. He goes Krypton. He always says Krypton. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. Is this planet called Krypton or Krypton? But, hey, Han Han. Yes. That's okay. I like that he said it differently. Dooku Doku. Yeah. Like, if you listen to interviews with George Lucas, he'll say Han or Han. Lando Calrissian will say Han, but it's Han. <laughs> yep. So, you know, so maybe it's just like that with Krypton. It's yeah, Krypton. I think so. It's, it's funny. It's Marlon Brando and just knowing the backstory and the history of Marlon Brando. But it's funny that he has these 
two like big powerhouse actors and they have like these little kind of aneurysms or whatever you want to call it. Or sorry, these, man. Yeah, these yeah. mannerisms and these yeah. stipulations like what's a mustache? Yeah. But back then in the seventies it was very dignified. Yeah. Like I mean <laughs> It was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we get introduced to him. He tells us that he's the greatest criminal of our time. Yep. You know, kind of self congratulating. <laughs> Who's who's uh, what's the woman's name in the show? Uh, Mrs. I think her name's, uh, uh, Miss Tessmacher. 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 Yeah, man, is she ever beautiful? Holy! I like her moly. character. She's like that guy. I loved her. I was yeah. like, wow, they yeah. picked a good one. Ba ba boom! Oh yes, she <laughs> is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, there's something about like some of these uh, these these gals from the '70s and '80s. They oh. Were, just like it's fine wine. There's, there's something. I don't know. <laughs> even even to the this day when you see it, you're like, damn, these gals. Yep, she was looking good. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but she's good. I mean, the thing is, also her character. Obviously, she's in with the wrong. Cr- like you have this beautiful yeah. woman who's probably like a failed starlet or model. Got in, you know, likes the bad boy and like Lex Luthor's, you know, the baddest as they come. <laughs> yeah. But you have this. It, this evil mastermind, then you have this beautiful woman, then you have this doofus. <laughs> it's a great trio, man. It's a great trio. I just like how he's like, uh, you were followed. And he turns around, knocks over the lamp. It's yeah. amazing, those cat-like reflexes. And, <laughs> and I just like, you know, did you get the paper? And he's like, uh, well, how come I'm not reading it? Because I haven't given it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great introduction to Lex Luthor. It is. And that takes us all the way back to the Daily Planet. Yes. Of course... In uh, superhero Hollywood fashion, everything, if it's going to happen, happens at that moment. And, uh, you know, because she's got to go to Air Force One and Clark. I don't, also, before that, I like how Clark, you could tell everybody kind of just dismisses Clark. He wants to get up on the elevator. Up, I'm going up. You know, and he's saying hi and bye and everybody's just walking past him. <laughs> he's like, he's invisible. He is. And the thing is, is Superman, he's, when, he, when he's Superman, he is invisible. All eyes are on him, but yeah. with Clark Kent. No eyes are on him. So I That's thought right. the movie That's great. and Christopher Reeve really translated that well. Okay. Lois Lane is about to embark in the helicopter. It has a malfunction. Uh, the operator gets knocked out. They fall, you know, they, they're caught on that big wire. Yeah. And then, and then they lose control and they're on the side of the building. Yeah. Who puts a bunch of wires on a helicopter pad? That seems a little weird. Yeah, you figured, you know, and like they actually had the people that were like attending it right by the wire as it was like jiggling around yeah. with the wire. Oh yeah, no big deal. Just let yeah, it go. Just let it go. Yeah. Well, it's this is in the this <laughs> is in the seventies. This is in the seventies. <laughs> I know. Details, details. Details, yeah. Uh, but there now she's hanging there and of course she's trying to get out and you could see she's frantic. I I, I like how say someone like screaming and all that can really come off over dramatic. Yeah. But I thought Margot Kidder kind of did it enough where you can see this is like, you know, you're on the edge. You're, you're going to fall into your appending doom. Yeah. Yeah. And, and later on in the film, she does, this happens again and she does a good job of it. Actually. I really, I really do like it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Really well. And then she obviously is a uh, hanging there and then Superman, uh, has to come to the rescue. Yeah, he well, he walks outside. He walks outside as Clark Kent, and he looks up like, "What's all the commotion about?" Because there's a about? crowd. There's a yeah, crowd. There's a crowd. Are, yeah. yeah, and he's looking up, and he's like, "Oh damn!" And then I gotta go. Yeah, and then he switches. He into the playing suit. hints a little bit yes. the underline of that uh, John Williams music, and because yeah. he's gotta get into his costume, but he's having trouble kind of finding the perfect spot. Yeah, to like where do I change? Yeah, and then he yeah. goes through that uh, the uh, rotating door. Yep, and I like how that pimp there is like. Ooh, damn, that's a big <laughs> costume. Like, Excuse me. <laughs> I just loved it. There was no point for it. I know, but it was great. It was awesome. And he jumps and flies up there yeah. and she falls and he grabs her and, you know. And the helicopter, does he yeah. not? Because yeah, the helicopter like, falls too? It does. But before that, he's like, you know, he grabs her and she's like, don't worry, miss, I got you. You got me. Who's got you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he flies up and the helicopter comes and you can see she's seeing it like she's about to lose her shit again mm-hmm. and he's just like Doo-doo-doo. and i love how this this scene this one scene here captures his great strength because just nonchalantly he grabs his helicopter one hand and just flies up there nonchalantly yeah i love it yeah and then after he does that and takes her back up to the rooftop i believe yeah. and the helicopter or whatever mm-hmm. and he goes uh he says you know statistically speaking it's still the safest way to travel yeah <laughs> 
I loved it. I, I love loved that. it. Yeah. That to me was like a callback to the old Batmans, how they yeah. would like give you like a safety message, kind of like that. Yeah. Remember, Robin, to brush your teeth before you go to bed. Yeah. Like some shit like <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good way, but he did it in such a way you're like, cool, this is this, yeah. this is a Boy Scout person I can get behind. And, you know, this man, this man is injured. Like he, he right, right there. And you see the contrast between Superman and uh, Clark Kent. Yeah. That's what I love about these. Two yeah. Movies. Very confident human being at this yeah. point as Superman. He, he knows what's up. He's smarter than a whip and uh, yeah. he, he commands the situation every time. He does. Like there's, yeah. there's such a commanding presence. Yeah. And then he, he, you know, talks to her and uh, you know, says whatever. And then she's like, <gasps> yeah, she's like, speechless. She's speechless. She even faints. Yeah. And then he flies off, and then we get this convenient, but I love it, montage of him. We got it, you know, and this is, I think, mm-hmm. the, the one thing that, unfortunately, we never got in Man of Steel is that you never got it, because it, it's like basically an alien invasion, and then he's Superman. It's like his first day where this, we get a montage where, okay, he saved this woman, and now he's going to go, and, you know, it's a great where he's flying around the city doing good deeds. Yeah, looking for it. trouble. Looking for trouble. Yeah. And <laughs> I and I, I love like uh, how the you know there's uh, the cops are chasing these uh, these guys a big shootout. Yep. They get away on that uh, on the boat, mm-hmm. and this is a perfect scene where they're counting their money, and and of course all between that there's that jewel thief. Yeah, he was scaling the building. Scaling the building. Yeah. Man, you man, you have to be super patient doing that. <laughs> scaling the building, and then uh, yeah. I just like I just like the one liners is like. The elevator out of order. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> and he's down. standing. Yeah, he's yeah. standing on the building sideways. Just, oh. That's so Superman going down, gets him. Yeah. And I like how he he flies to the cop and the officer. And there's the scene where, well, before that, Superman uh, apprehends those uh, those the, those thieves, the money thieves, yes. or the, the robbers. Yeah. And you know, and on the boat, I just I just love how that they're seeing this guy standing there with his his arms crossed, and then the one guy comes up with the uh, what is it, a crowbar? It's something like that. And yeah. he hits him and, <laughs> you know, he's like, bad vibrations. And I like the line, bad vibrations. Yeah. And then we, we the cop is talking to his uh, superior about <laughs> this flying guy. And he's like, all right, all right, all right, you've been drinking. Yeah. Or no, he's like, yeah, take the night off and, and go to the go to the bar and, and have a couple of like that. Finish, finish what you started. Yeah, finish and what I'll you started. I'll be there in a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then they, they see the boat right there and they come out and... The men apprehended, and they see him flying away. Yeah, and then after this, uh, you see a little girl trying to get oh, a no. cat out of a yeah, tree, or cat. what happens before? Anything? No, the cat out of the tree. Yeah, yeah. So then he flies down and, and helps this little girl get the cat out of the tree. Mm. What I like about this is because it shows you that there's no job too small yeah. for Superman, yeah. and this was great. And it, and it shows his, his nice little interaction with like children. That this is this is a guy that you can trust and that yes. is tender. He's he's understanding. The scene has a bitter end, though. Do you? Re- oh, <laughs> oh man. yeah, I, I, love, I, I love it. I, like, I love I went it. back in my chair as I because like the, the poor little girl. She's got her cat back. You mommy, know, she has. Mommy. She walks in the door. Mommy, this flying man helped me save the cat, and all I hear is. Right well, across. yeah, she's like, didn't I tell you about telling lies? Like typical, like seventies yeah. and eighties parenting. Yeah, she got a whooping. She got a good. <laughs> she good got a backhand. It, it was a funny little scene that put in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ooh, damn, that sounded like it hurt. Hey, sometimes you can't tell lies. Yes, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I never got smacked as a kid. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh-oh, yeah. That's right. And then that takes us to a scene where um, he saves the Air Force One. Yes, he does. Uh, lightning strikes, I believe. Lightning mean. strikes. Yeah, blows out an engine. Yeah. And I like how that kind of ties into, actually, uh, Lois Lane was going to intercept Air Force One in a helicopter. She was mm. going to go meet them, Air Force yeah. One. So this, this scene is. They great. did a good job of bringing it together. They bring it together, and yeah. it's it lightning strikes, and they lose the one motor, and they're going down. But Soups is there. Yeah, and and the one co-pilot was like, "Hey, how is this possible? How are we leveling out?" And he goes, "You know what? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. So don't even look out the window. Yeah, <laughs> don't even look." And they're just watching yeah. Superman fly under the wing as the extra engine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's it, it's great, and really after that we kind of get to uh, um, the, the headlines, right? We get, we're at uh, did I, am I not missing? We're we're right where we need to be. That it, now they're at the Daily Planet. Did where is it? Uh, Lex Luthor. Uh, I well, I have here back at the Fortress of Solitude speaking with right. His this is where he, this is the, uh, the the deleted scene that's reinserted. He's talking to Jarrell. Yes, I almost forgot about the good. Yeah. You brought that up. Okay, yeah, he's talking to Jarrell. <laughs> yeah. 
That's all I got. That's all you got. <laughs> but, 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 all but, I got. but again, this is another scene that I'm glad that they reinserted because mm-hmm. not only we get to see more of Marlon Brando, you know. He's great. I love Marlon Brando. But it's a good scene because he's talking to him and they're talking about him revealing himself and the, the joy. And he even tells him that don't feel guilty about your vanity, you know, because then he kind of says that even the greatest minds. And I think he was kind of also alluding to himself on Krypton that it's everywhere. And then I like how he says 28 hours, you know, cause he's kind of basically yeah. talking about, you know, you're going to be a 24 hour kind of hotline yep. uh, of uh, emergency services. Pretty much. I thought it was also another great scene where jor says, I anticipated this. And he was like, well, how could you anticipate this? You're dead. Mm-hmm. I thought that was great, but it shows you just the, 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 the overseeing of jor and, you know, how you can see far beyond anything, you know. He, so it was a great scene. And then he, he kind of basically tells him, I, I wish, I don't know why they took this scene out, but tells him, if I was still alive, I, I wish I could be there to embrace you. And he's, you see oh, Clark put yeah. his hands up, that yeah. yearning, because, you know, that's his real father. He lost his other father. Yeah, that was a great scene. Yeah. I liked it. Great scene. And then that t- kind of takes us to the Daily Planet. And they're all in a frenzy. The Superman, who is this guy? And this is a great scene, too, because right there, we got to find out this guy, you know, and then we get kind of a little a little note sent to Lois Lane while he's talking about this, that a friend. Because he, he, he says, she asks him when she saves her earlier, who are you? And he's like, a friend. Because at that point, we don't, he's not Superman. Like, we, you know, because Lois Lane has to give him the Superman. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, she names him pretty much. Yeah, she names him. Yeah. And she, she has that note, and he's talking about, who is this guy? Because you have a girlfriend. And I like that scene where Lois Lane's kind of smiling, and, of course, uh, Kent is looking, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. I, I really like the, the pecking order in the in the mail room there when when uh, the boss is telling Jimmy to uh, give me a coffee, black, no sugar, or whatever, black, no cream, or, yeah, black, no sugar. Right, Chief. And, Right, Chief. And then he's like to the next guy, yeah, get him a coffee. You know, so like they keep pecking down the <laughs> Also, I want to highlight that, that uh, the staff there, how diverse. Very diverse, Very actually. Very diverse. Yep. Like, uh, you know, because I, I think sometimes with Hollywood now today with kind of that woke agenda, you, you it almost like makes you think that in Hollywood films that there was no diversity. And you see in this film, like there, there, there was. There absolutely was. Um, yeah, like... It's really sad because, like like you said, like Hollywood today is like telling people, oh, back then there was no diversity in film. And you're like, what? Really? There wasn't? It was just white people? It's like, no. And then you go watch Superman 78 and you're like, no, no, you're wrong. There was diversity in those like, films. It, I mean, obviously it wasn't like it is today diverse. And I'm sure there was still yeah. there was still things because it is Hollywood. It, Absolutely. It, it is elitism. Yeah. Don't, don't get me For wrong. For sure. But when you kind of look at the production of these, like I always say – if you want to really look at the truth of watch a lot of the making of uh, these movies and you see this whole eclectic of people from mm-hmm. all over the world working together. Because one thing when you make a movie, you want to bring in the best talent you can. So I think that supersedes uh, all that stuff. You know, it, it, we want to get the best person. So if you're you happen to be a female and you're good at it, they bring you in. Yep. Uh, like, but anyways, yeah, aside on. from that, yeah. besides for that, I just want to say, cause it's watching the film. I'm looking, I'm like, this is a pretty diverse film. It is. And then watching kind of the making and the production crew. I'm like, eh, there's a little more diversity than I even thought. Yep. Okay. Lois Lane is on her, uh, penthouse balcony looking all sexy, having a glass, but she's frantic. You can tell she's like, yeah, <sighs> cause she she's thinks it's Superman. Like really relaxed clothing. <laughs> Very. Well, it's a nightcap, nightcap. Clothing. Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, there's Superman. Yeah. So, like, yeah, this is the guy good. that saved her life, and she's ex- man. How could she not be excited? Mm-hmm. But he he kind of shows up. This is a great scene. <laughs> yeah. So he shows up there, and um, she wants to sit him down and ask him a few questions, interview him, you know, yeah. get to know him. And uh, the, one of the couple of lines that really threw me were, uh, right away. She's like, "So how big are you?" <laughs> and she and he's like. Uh, I mean, how tall are you? Yeah. <laughs> I just love that. That oh, was yeah, a great, for sure. great question. You can imagine that's running through her mind. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. How big is that super dick? <laughs> but yeah, but you, you, you can just tell that she's awestruck because the mm. film, nothing really, really kind of gets to Lois Lane, you know, but this, this guy, Superman does. the Superman, 
you know, she's she's like a little kid. Like she's, you know, like you said, starstruck. Mm -hmm. So she's fumbling with her words because usually she knows what to say. Like, you know, she never has like the tip of the tongue phenomenon. It's right. It's the Superman's. It, that's why she's, you know, and then the questions she's asking and then, you know, and he's like, are you OK? But yeah, it's, it's and a, you're going to you're going to hate me for this. But I like one of his inabilities that I totally forgot about was not being able to see through lead. And this reminded me in the question period there or the interview when he said, I can't see through lead. And I don't know. I just like totally forgot about that. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's right. Like, I don't know. I just some one of the, the details that I had totally forgot about Superman. But yeah, I got reminded of it yesterday. So, yeah, so that, that's that's yeah. OK. That, that I think some they don't. But it's a big one. You know, it's a big one. But it, it is, especially back then. But like. A lot of the comics I've read in more recent times doesn't really like focus on his inability. Yeah, you know, and then the latest, like in 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 the more uh, recent Superman films, I don't remember them taking a lot of time with that. No, like not being able to see through lead. Heck, man, they didn't take the time in, in the recent Superman that Lois Lane didn't know Clark Kent and Superman are one and the same. She right off the bat knows who he is. Yeah, which is okay. I'm actually okay with that yeah. because Lois Lane, in a way, her not knowing. One of the same kind of makes her a little bit dumb. Yeah. I don't want to say dumb, but it's Lois Lane, a Pulitzer Surprise reporter. Yeah, yeah. Would have better intuition than that. Probably. Especially. It's what makes her great, I guess. That's yeah. what makes Lois Lane great. It, it was good for like the comics back in the day and even these movies. But as far as contemporary time, it's, it's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. I, I get why they chose those in those movies. Yeah. So, and another question that I really like that she asked him, and, and she asked him, uh, do you have a girlfriend? And he says, no, but you'd be the first oh, to know. And I, right there, I'm like thinking, like, he just, he loves her. Like, he wants to be with her. Yeah. And, and this totally just makes sense, and it goes over her head because she doesn't know what he's thinking, right? So, no, but you, like but you see her kind of blushing and smiling. Yes. Like, like, like yeah. kind of like, like a schoolgirl crush. Mm -hmm. where, you know, like these, these are almost like high school crushes happening here. Yeah. Because, like, he's gaga over her. Like, he was gaga before her, but now she's gaga over him. So, mm. it's a, a great <laughs> chemistry between the actors. Yeah. Uh, and the, even if, uh, but with the lead thing, you know, can, okay, well, what kind of uh, color underwear? Because you can see through everything because she's asking him about his abilities. And he's kind of like, huh. And she mistakens it for that he's uh, blushing or, you know, kind of caught, you know. Yeah, tongue-tied. Tongue-tied. But it's because it's lead. And then he kind of reveals, I can't see lead. And she says, and then eventually he says pink. Mm -hmm. And I like how that actually, yeah. they kind of leave that. And she kind of, you know, kind of, doesn't she kind of blush? But then they're interviewing, they're sitting down interviewing. I know before that, that she's having a smoke. And this is great. Oh, yes. Great 80s. Uh, you know, she lays up a smoke and he's tell, he kind of does the old Boy Scout. Really, Miss Lane, you shouldn't smoke. Yeah cancer and then he, he gives you a chance to, to see his abilities well and, yeah and she says what am i gonna die and he goes well not yet not yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like uh, and then she puts it out yeah and then yeah. she puts it out and then they're interviewing more and sitting down and she's asking more questions it's kind of funny when he reveals the lead thing i thought that was really kind of like i'm not really responsible superman like because he just had a scene talking to Jarrell about protecting the people around him and he just revealed one of his weaknesses he, he did out to the world and even like her to even yeah. to put it out there herself you kind of like these two are not because mm. i guess they're so infatuated that yeah you know, they love each other so much that they're willing to divulge yeah. a bit too much yeah i like how she likes do you like pink He's like, I like pink very much. <laughs> <laughs> you just you, you just hear some music in the background. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There there are some interesting moments yeah. in this film. And then she asks him like how fast he can fly, and he's like, I never really timed myself. And then huh? And then he's just like, Kate, hey, we're going for it. Yeah. He's like, let's go for a ride. And she's like, she's kind of like, are you serious? No, I'm not dressed for it. Ah, it's all good. And I like how he takes charge because again, to kind of like. Um, correlate that to her in Clark Kent Lois Lane's always in charge of that relationship where here Superman's like taking the lead and I, I like yeah. that yeah oh yeah absolutely and this is takes us to the scene it's a fun cute scene but to be honest with you watching it again I found it really hokey dokey oh of course it was like I kind of when I was watching I kind of just took checked my I was like I can't it was a yeah too much it, it reminded me of like like uh Leia in space and Last Jedi <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Can Lois breathe in space? But I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe they're not in space. And as she's falling, they're obviously clearly still in the atmosphere. But still, it's like the air is really thin up there. I don't think a human being could, you know, um, breathe up there. But whatever. I'll let that go. Not well, a big deal. Well, I just thought it was just with the music. It was just very hokey. Like it was, it went on a little too long. Yeah. And, then, and then do you read my mind? And I, I, it just doesn't work for me. Probably now in contemporary time. Mm. Back then, you know, as a kid, you're you're cool with it. And probably back then it was fine. But yeah. now it's like, eh, I could have done without the scene. Yeah. I, I chalked it up as a flying ballet. <laughs> it yes, kind of looked like a ballet. Yeah. Like it was there, cute, yeah. but it was like, eh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically they land back at her pad there and she pretty much names him like Superman after he leaves. Yeah. Of course, Clark, because the real date was her and Clark. And yeah. like, she is so in the clouds. Yeah. That's 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 clark nice and you're like hey and he, he goes back into that clark camp persona and i thought this it was again highlight everything and bringing back to like clark Kent. it was great I, yeah when he came in and she's getting ready she's like hold on i'm just getting ready or whatever and he's standing there and and he takes off his glasses and he, you can tell he's about to tell her like hey lois i want to tell you something but he ends up putting them back mm-hmm. on but there there's a slight smirk on his face that he kind of gives a smart like it's a really wonderful little smirk and he stands up straight and he puffs out his chest and he get, i just i don't know i just really love that because it was like the superman within the clark Kent, and it was it was just great I <sighs> yeah loved it. it's, it's great how you can go between both yeah because like you said he was always kind of like hunched over just mm-hmm. a little bit as clark and then he would just stand up straight as superman and another kind of thing with the movie that clark was never depicted as like a kind of like a clumsy doofus was uh, that all him n- well this is what they did in the movie uh, just like the right. Kent dying it yep. was the first time that they kind of, you know, the iteration of it, and same with Clark, because up before that, he, he wasn't like a kind of a, a clumsy doofus. So who who's responsible for creating the, movie, the, the character? The movie, okay. uh, the movie yeah, yeah. those characteristics, yeah. those characteristics, you know, so most people think, you know, now in so many other iterations, the, the, actually, they, they actually play upon that in the Superman All-Stars. Where Clark Kent is depicted as the Clark Kent in the the film, he's okay. clumsy, and there's a cool scene where Lex Luthor's in jail and he's talking, and Clark's interviewing him, and he's like tripping over stuff, and Lex Luthor's like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Go read that uh, graphic novel uh, if you're a Superman <laughs> fan or you're interested in Superman. Thanks for that, Raz. <laughs> <laughs> one day I'll get Turk. Yeah, one day. It's. <laughs> And so, meanwhile, uh, our uh, criminal genius Lex Luthor learns of a joint U.S. Army and U.S. Navy nuclear missile test. And he buys hundreds of acres of worthless desert. In California. (laughs) California. Uh, Because he wants those missiles to detonate in the San Andreas Fault, right? Yes, to separate California. To separate. To basically make the western coast of California kind of fall into the ocean, leaving only just that section of California. Yes, yeah. but now that Superman, because they they they're reading Superman's uh, vitals in the paper and they're talking about yeah, it. it's a it's a funny scene that yeah. he's he's sitting there in his library yeah, and he he's talking about Superman. So they know okay, well, but the problem is Superman probably could uh, fort them. So he kind of starts telling them that there's a meteorite, and he kind of leads his crew on to. You know, he kind of, he's like, hey, guys, uh, this can be lethal to him. Yeah. And I just like how Otis, he's up there. He takes he t- takes the freaking ladder. <laughs> oh, M, M. <laughs> <laughs> and he's hanging from the ladder. And he's like, no, N as in Nick and Poop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he steps on his hands. And I just like how he talks about, like, the the, the, the number 200. I mean, he refers to my, his IQ and, and his your weight. weight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then you kind of learn in the scene that Miss um, Tessmacher, she's smarter than she kind of lets on to be. She is. You know, like she's quite, isn't it? You're like, okay, this is why she was with Lexa Luther. Like she's quite clever. Yeah. Funny little scene with her. She's like talking about his father, but when he's buying uh, land and he goes, the first, one of the, the first thing my father said to me, she's like, get out. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's no. like, no, before that, before that. Uh, so, so again, just funny. She is clever. Uh, yeah. yeah. And also just how Gene Hackman, you always sometimes forget how funny Gene Hackman is. He is. You know, he's, he, great. he's really good. He can play it all. But anyways, yeah, I thought, 
good scene that kind of sets us up to and the movie kind of starts going to really it's kind of climax like it's climax because they're uh they go get those missiles right yeah like this this yeah this is where the movie really starts moving it does move um and then they take a couple of whacks at it yeah and so they (laughs) yeah it's it's yeah you thought you would they would have got on the first try but i guess with otis doing things well here's okay and here's the thing reprogramming a nuclear missile you're gonna leave it up to some doofus bumbling idiot who loves to eat all the time and he he, he writes it on his arm why couldn't he have it on a piece of paper yeah and he's like oh i guess my arm wasn't long Uh, enough (laughs) oh and then he and and this is where the logistics of this film you kind of have to just let it go but they start with uh, a car an accident yeah and we, we get a nice cameo of uh uh, Jr. from uh, Dallas is oh, the commander. Right. Yeah, yeah. And they gotta, they gotta do mouth to mouth resuscitation. It's funny. They're like, yeah. What should we do? Well, we should massage the chest and give mouth to mouth. Yeah, and then <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and the one, the one soldier there is he's ready. Though this just shows you like the like you look at the car and then you look at this person on the ground. They'd be all mangled, <laughs> but of course, you know she's fine. So these yeah. guys, we better, we better resuscitate her. And I just yep. like I. They surround him, and <laughs> oh, it's good. And then Otis is doing the number, sweating. Yes. He's hiding behind. He has his little tree. Oh, it's a great scene. Mm-hmm. Puts in the numbers, and he's running back there. And, of course, Lex Luthor shows up as the paramedic. Somebody hurt? Yeah. <laughs> just not yeah. Sure. And then they're like, give me, give me a stretcher. And then, like, one corporal says to another guy, get him a stretcher. And then they're all, like, relaying, get him a stretcher, get him a stretcher. <laughs> a stretcher. They're like, what are you standing here for? So then all 50 of them go and get a stretcher. Yeah. <laughs> It's so campy, yeah. but it's, oh, it's hilarious. It's good. Yeah. And then, Lex, then they're in the the Otis. They're in the ambulance, and Otis is all excited. I did it, Mister Luthor. Mm-hmm. I Mr. did Luthor. it. And you know, Lex Luthor, again, what in his right mind is Lex Luthor thinking that he would, you know, give this responsibility to Otis, this Otis? Yeah. And he's asking him. So Otis, it's not like I uh, don't trust you, but okay, <laughs> I, don't I don't trust, trust you. you. What'd you do? Yeah, <laughs> talks about the number, and you can just see Lex Luthor's like, what the. He screws up. Screws up. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. The 11 and the 7 is, oh, I didn't have a long arm. Oh, my God. <laughs> you want to yeah. see a long arm? I'll show you a long arm. <laughs> so, so, so she has to take the wheel and test my Yeah, he jumps wheel. back there and beats the crap out of Otis. Yeah. And then the next scene is uh, Otis and, uh, which I like the detail where Otis has a black eye. He does. But the question is, how... Did Lex Luthor foresee that he'd have these... Co- I, he must have because he has an ambulance. He has this co- remote control car. Yep. Now he has a, 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 a semi, semi. A semi-trailer. And he has access to an area that's restricted by the military. Yeah. I am legit... You're like, holy shit. He, he has some... He's some, got a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of... Uh, <laughs> but but funny, yet he's got a layer in a, new, in a metropolis subway. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. But how did he get that so fast, or did he have that on hand? I don't know. It's a little bit. Uh, so, anyways, Miss Tejmacher, I believe, finishes the job. Well, and gets yeah, it right. you got to give it to the right person. That's right. If she gets it done, yep, she does. <laughs> and I, I just like that interaction with there. They're like, "What are we doing here? Ha, how y'all do it?" <laughs> yeah, so I he should have gave it to her in the first place. Yes. So he's got the nuclear warhead, and then uh, uh, we learn we, we're back at the Daily Planet, and course clark is looking for lois as always and then he learns that she's went to go talk to some uh guy that sold a bunch of worthless land to some unknown person which is yeah it was a a chief of a um yeah reserve or something yeah yeah and so she's interviewing him in the car she's driving i like this like she's driving and and putting the microphone up to his mouth and he's like hey watch the road and she's like (laughs) she's she's all over the road she can't do it perry white is uh, kind of it's trying to motivate Clark. He's like, you have stuff, but you're missing something. Mm-hmm. And he's going on, and then we hear that, the dog whistle. Yeah, it's like a high-pitched frequency. Uh, yeah, frequency. Yeah. yeah. It was a cool scene to hear him, and he's like, okay, come on, Superman. You know, which is smart of Lex Luthor. Like, he knows Superman's going to you know, be there to try to thwart him, so yep. he may as well, like, attack it head-on, because he's got the kryptonite. Yep, and this is when he puts Superman through the, uh, the gauntlet yep. of... Uh, of deadly destruction, yeah. I guess, you know, with yeah. bullets and flame mm-hmm. and ice cold temperatures. Mm-hmm. And with each test, uh, Superman just shrugs it off his shoulder because he passes it, yeah. no problem. That was perfect setup for yeah. the kryptonite. Yes. And, and But you see through that, 
uh, Tessmacher, Teschmacher, she's she's rooting for him. You can tell she's, yes, she's, she's like, she likes him. Well, she likes him, eh? <laughs> well, yeah. Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Superman. Yeah. And then he, <laughs> I like the moment when he's breaking through the door and Otis has got his ear against it. <laughs> he's coming through the door! <laughs> <laughs> so he breaks it, he, he breaks through, and I, I love the, the line, come in, it's open. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, what did he say? Like, I'll have my insurance guys my contact lawyers, you. Yeah, sure. Like, you're going to yeah. get a dime out of yeah. Superman. And it's a good scene because, like, the back and forth between Superman and Lex Luthor is great. And I like how the, this actually handles, because, you know, it's always cliche in movies where the villain always says his whole master plan. And it's a, a long, drawn out. Yeah. I never thought this was long, drawn out. You, you, you knew that he was kind of buying some time was superman and he's telling him what's happening but i thought in a way it was it, it didn't feel drawn out or cliche yeah, yeah. i like otisburg <laughs> he's otisburg, showing him the get that off of there after what? The earthquake. It's <laughs> it's a, otisburg <laughs> it's poor otis just yeah. wants his own little chunk of land yeah in some ways really clever because he's got two because at that point superman doesn't oh you got two and he tells him his two directions and even with your great speed you can't yeah. be everywhere at once. Yes. So I thought he put Superman in a real compromising position. He did. That was good. And you can see like Superman realizes uh, this is a real threat. And then you, you see, uh, was that Cliff from uh, Cheers? One of the... Cliff Clavin? <laughs> yeah, Cliff Clavin. Uh, sir, there's a nuclear warhead. He's one of the guys there. Oh, maybe. I Yeah. He appears in Empire Strikes Back and in Superman. You know, I... Yeah, sometimes I have a hard time just kind of picking out uh, cameos. Hey, like I don't really notice it a lot, but... Yeah, well, he's really yeah. young there. True. You watch the movie enough and then you watch Cheers. Yes, yes. Okay. You kind of tend to kind of yeah. notice that shit. But <laughs> yeah, so the nuclear warheads and then uh, he talks about the detonators in his head and then the chest that's lead. And I like a yell smart Superman. Yeah, well, that's Lois's yeah. fault for printing. Yeah, it is Lois. <laughs> Lois typical, typical mm-hmm. Lois Lane, always <laughs> ruining stuff for Superman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah. So the Kryptonite, and I like that. You know, the the, the scene they show you that he's in vulnerable, invincible, and but this little piece of rock. Yeah, you know, which is something that you figure Lex Luthor would just stab him or something or shoot him. But yeah. I figured. Uh, drowning would be better. Yes. Which is cool. That again, it shows the functionality of like the movie. It's not just this pool, indoor pool. That's right. It has functionality where it would be the impending doom for the Man of Steel, mm-hmm. which I thought was good. And he's in there and he shows he's weak. And I thought Christopher Reeve really played that off. Really he well. did a pretty good job of that. Yeah. Yeah. And but they all unravels because Lex Luthor, uh, his test mockers, like my mom lives in the New one Jersey, of the, New I think Jersey, is where that one missile is heading. Just typical. He just looks at his watch and then shakes his head. Nah. Not long, not for long, <laughs> and that you know he. So that, that's yeah, that's where his weakness is, or like where Lex Luthor, like he thinks you know, <laughs> you can't be that cold blooded to people that are working. For no, him. no, because yeah. they are gonna stab you in the back. So then Superman is in trouble, and uh, Ms. yeah, he's drowning, he's and, drowning, and then Miss Teshmarker show, shows up yeah. and is talking with him. Yeah. You know, and, you know, saying, like, I'll help you, but only if you help my mother first in New Jersey. And he's like, but I have to, you know, stop this other missile from happening. And she goes, I'm not going to help you unless you promise me, because I know you only tell the truth. And if you promise me that you'll save my mother first, I'll... I'll help you. And he goes, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll save your mother first. And then she goes down there and takes yeah. the, the chain with the uh, kryptonite on it and takes it off of him. And then he begins to get his strength back. And then he goes after her because one missile is going eastbound and one's going westbound. Yeah, that's right. And he goes after that. And I think he goes after the eastbound one. He has to because yeah, he told he her he would. Her. Yeah. So he goes after that one. And he gets it and he, he, he pushes it into outer space. Yes. But he doesn't prevent the westbound missile from uh, Hitting exploding at the, the San Andreas line. fault line, yeah. which is, yeah. And then all hell breaks loose at this point. Massive earthquakes. Yeah. Everything, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, Hoover Dam, uh, and Superman has to kind of mitigate through the everything. So he ends up, it goes into the Earth's core. Well, yeah, and then he's trying to put the fault line back together. Also... With all the earthquakes and the rocks crumbling and causing avalanches and stuff. In the Hoover Dam breaking with all the water gushing, he tries to dam it himself by putting rocks in front of it and stuff. And he does. And in the meantime, as he does that, he actually 
helps that native or that yeah the 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 reserve there by give, giving them water back again because remember they said years ago they it was had so lost, dry it was so they dry they lost dry. water right so they had no value and that's why he wanted to get rid of that the worthless land yes and so right. now um by superman kind of creating a different dam it forced the water to run through that that reserve again and then once again they were happy that they yeah. had water yeah yeah you know, that guy was in the, the movie for like a couple seconds but i i i he i enjoyed him yeah he was i, I great. just like how he talked I, you, you're like i like this guy like yeah follow the scare <laughs> yeah it was good yeah and at that time so superman is uh, kind of repairing the the fault line and, and i love the scene and i love the effects where you see him i've heard some people criticize this but i like that he's 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 in the molten lava he's in the earth's core kind that was of cool and he's flying through yep. there and he's lifting the rock and putting it back together yeah and then like you said he's you know with the rocks and the water and mm-hmm. the dam uh, it's a it's a great again it's another great scene of him showcasing what Superman does like with the train the track is compromised so he just uses himself yeah he becomes the missing piece of the, the track missing piece of the yeah. track which is yeah Superman would and then the school bus yeah and with the kids school bus on the bridge and the one yeah. Michael Jackson looking guy the young Michael <laughs> Jackson thanks Superman <laughs> yeah that was good oh and of course. Poor Lois Lane. And I like how, like, Jimmy with the Hoover Dam, he almost falls. And he's, like, taking pictures because he's trying to get the scoop. And he almost falls yeah. to his impending doom. But Superman saves him. But I like how when he puts him <laughs> down in that area, the safety, it's, like, even just as perilous. His yeah. rocks yeah, falling down. like, oh, shit. Oh, there's shit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he's got to go. You know, he's got to go get Lois Lane. Yeah, and poor Lois Lane. And I thought that scene, the way it was cut. Yeah, you can kind of see like her frantic and the, how the 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 earth opens up and then her car is uh, being sucked into yep. the ground. Yeah, and, and then you see all this dirt and gravel. Yeah, you know, and it's so filling deep. it's filling up the car inside, and she's frantic. And again, like I said, this is this is the other scene where I I really do believe that she is in peril, and she doesn't oversell it. She no, does good great, hair. great acting yeah. by Margot Kidder and stuff. Yeah. Like, it wasn't where enough where you were annoyed with the screen, but you're like, because you, you want you want Superman to get there so quick because it's yeah. Lois Lane, eh? And you're yeah. not expecting, so he does get there, but he doesn't make it in time. Mm-hmm. And it is a scene. He pulls out the car, and I just like just like even the the door. He just rips it off, eh? And yeah, pulls her out, and then he realizes he lost her, and that all ties into losing his home world krypton and then losing his dad there's like that moment of helplessness with superman yeah and then you can't help to rethink that mm-hmm. line where he says all this power and i couldn't save her and it also touches upon a line i i, I kind of forgot to mention when he's talking to his father with his power he it is forbidden for him to interfere with humankind so like kind of telling him you you can help them and you can guide them but it, it is you cannot change you know mm-hmm. reality for them yeah so i thought that kind of coming around so but again all this is coming to a head with Superman because it's it's a quiet scene, music playing subtly, and you see this loss in Superman, and then he just kind of screams and loses it. He gets angry here. He gets angry. Really angry. And he flies up there. He's and, like, screw this. I'm going to fucking yeah. do it my way. Yeah. And, and so he forces the Earth to spin backwards. Yeah. I personally never liked this. But, okay, so I agree with that. Like I, I thought agree it was just, that it's, it's a cop out. Convenient. It's a cop out, yeah. but it's also 1978, and I know time travel is not really feasible, anyways. Mm-hmm. But I think the idea of time travel was still in its very like infancy back then, and I don't think people knew how to conceptualize time travel. And I think by him spinning the Earth backwards would just give you that. Okay, I get it. You know what I mean? But I, I think today's world, we've seen so many time travel films that like that's just preposterous now. Mm-hmm. Right? You know what I mean? So I, I'm OK with that. Like you just have to kind of remember, like, what was the what were people thinking in 1978? What time travel could have been? I, I feel like that could have been one of the iterations. Of oh, that. for sure. I, I think I think yeah. I understand what you're saying yeah. that at the time this was a way. But even as a kid, I personally was not really big on this spinning the earth uh, on the opposite axis to, okay. to revert. Lois Lane's death. I, I they could have, you know, maybe he resuscitated her. Or it would to me it would have worked better. I don't know. I, I, I just I don't like time travel things. You know, it's, it's like the world to end worlds. With, I know in Rebels and Star Wars. I'm I'm still kind of on the fence if I like that. I, I still like it. I like you it. and you and Dark Matter both <laughs> both like that. I, I accept it, but I'm kind of like hey, yeah. Man. You know, it's it's of the it's of the subject really. You gotta kind of make it blend really yeah. well with this. 
superpower that he was like this was the ultimate superpower that he really did unleash yeah. to save the one that he loved and it, and it does make sense into the movie because his dad does really like say that it's forbidden to do stuff like this yes. because you you have this great power and like with, with superman like his powers there is no limits i know a lot of people talk about the credible hulk and the anger he he gets and more powerful but it's like yeah the more superman is exposed to the sun the more powerful like he's almost limitless but yeah it, it's a great way but anyways mm. yeah i was always a little bit ah, but it mm-hmm. works it does tie in nicely because that when he does reverse all that stuff and then he goes and sees lois lane she's fine she just ran out of gas and she's kind of gives him shit <laughs> Yeah. Like, it's typical uh, Lois Lane would do that. Yeah, and then Jimmy shows up running. And he gives him shit. He's like, you put me in a super dangerous area. What were you thinking? (laughs) You know? And, of course, he cock blocks because they were going to have a moment. Yes. Like, really, if you think about the movie, they don't really, they don't kiss. No, they don't. Like, which, again, so brilliant in a lot of these movies and these superheroes with the love interest, it, it's nice to let it sometimes ferment and yep. build. And they almost did. Do, they need they to kiss. Yeah, they didn't need to. I, that's why the thing about Man of Steel. That I thought the love, the the yeah. love between them was a little too quick and convenient. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I get where that. this plays it better. But mm-hmm. again, this is my personal taste. Yeah. But I thought that, I'm like they almost did, but they didn't. Jimmy Olsen comes, and I like how they're giving him shit, but then. He's like, he's got to go. Yeah. And, and I like how Jimmy Olsen, and I like how Lois Lane kind of downplays it. He's like, well, he sure, he sure likes you, Lois. <laughs> well, no, yeah. he likes everybody. Yeah. Or she says Clark. She at first thinks Clark or something. Yes. So of course Clark cares. And he goes, no, Superman. And she's like, well, he cares about everybody. But yeah. Oh, no, he cares about Lois. That's right. Mm-hmm. So then uh, he flies off to go pay a visit to Luther. Yeah. <laughs> Luther's playing the piano, and uh, he's got uh, Miss Tejmacher, Tejmacher hanging hanging in the balance, and Otis has got the rope there. You know how he always fed the babies, the, the baby kittens they had down there? I do not have that scene in my cut. You don't have that scene in your cut? No. Wow. Okay, okay. Wait, go, go on. Well, let me, let me try and describe the scene the best I can. I That's probably won't be yeah. great at it, but <laughs> anyway, so he flies back to go see... Uh, Luther. Luther's at his lair playing the piano. There there was a thing, they have like a little, it's like a, a um, what do you call it, like a pit full of like wild cats. You never see them, but you hear them like making the roaring sounds. Like it, if you're at the zoo and you heard a tiger roar, you would hear those. And it was like there were several vicious cats down in this pit. And there is a scene in the middle of the film where he says, Otis, feed the babies. And he's like, no, I don't want to feed the babies. Feed the babies, Otis. He's like, no, I don't want to feed the babies. And so he's like, okay, fine, I'll feed the babies, right? And, he, and he's got this big rope on a pulley. And there's this big hunk of meat, looks like this, like the, a half of a cow. And he lowers it into the pit. And you can hear the, the ravaging animals down there, like, feast on this. And then he pulls it up, and then there's just nothing but bones left. What? Yeah. I've never seen this It's scene. in there. Anyways, and so then at the end of this film, he, this is where he's like, Otis, now. And he's like, no, no, I'm not doing it. And he's like, you're doing it. And it's Miss Tejmacher hanging from the rope. And he's lowering her into the pit of these beasts but just as he does that oh. superman shows up and saves miss tejmacher oh it's actually a really seen, fun I, scene i like the sound i, I gotta see I, I i gotta i gotta get uh, that. yeah i'll get i'll take i'll get if it's on there yeah i'll get that yeah you'll gotta, get it man you'll it. see it no um, but, but i think it was great my version does not have that i, I have i think everything except that scene. okay so where does your scene where does your well, version a, end? after that we just we get cut to after he leaves Lois and Jimmy, he we cut to him at the penitentiary. Yes, that's right. Where yes. he brings uh, Otis Luther and Otis. Luther. Obvious overdub of the voice of the warden. Yeah. Hey, Superman, what's going on? <laughs> Lex Luthor. And he's like, I'm the criminal mastermind. And I like how Otis is like <laughs> echoing him. A more time! <laughs> He, there, and then, yeah, another trope in the film was Otis was always mimicking or, or repeating yeah. what he said. What could any one want? Any more want? Eh? Yeah, that's right. And, and you just see Lex just like, oh my god. Yeah, I love it. Like you can tell Otis in a way looks up to him. He does. That's his hero. <laughs> that's probably why he has him. It, it's probably yeah. You're right. Oh man. I and love then him. of course the 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 great John Williams comes in again with the oh, Superman yeah. theme and, it's... and and I just like the scene. He's like, thanks for saving the day, Superman, which was kind of odd coming from just this penitentiary warden yeah like it would have been better maybe if it was the president yeah whatever yeah, that's true that's true but he flies away and we're, but I, I still like the scene like we're all part of the same team because that yes. again encapsulates superman superman does not feel like he's any better than anybody and you know you could be a grunt and superman still views you 
on the same level as him. That's what makes the character special. So anybody that says he's not special, go fuck yourself. That's right. <laughs> and one thing I forgot to mention, during the interview when uh, Lois is interviewing Superman on the uh, balcony, I forgot. This is an important uh, thing that actually should have been said is she asks him, like, why are you doing this? What, what's your what's your what's your motive? What's your M.O.? Why are you, you know, and he's like, I stand for truth, justice in the American way. Yeah, that has always been his motto. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like we should have mentioned that. But I just want to make sure that we got that out there. Well, we got it. Because because yeah. I feel like in the future iterations of Superman, I don't know if that's going to stick anymore. No, and it's kind of hard because to kind of reach a global audience and stuff, you can't just say for truth, justice in the American way. You can, you know what I mean? Like, I get it. it but why is does a superhero story? have to be the global guy? Like, why? No, it's just in the Don't world. Don't have to. It's the world we're living in. Yeah, I know. I agree. I agree I with know. you that it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter because his message, do, that's the thing about Superman. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter that it's an American based character or the, the person lives there. Him, truth and justice, the American way can translate to anywhere being a good person it can but then when you know when you start talking about other superheroes like batman he's a superhero in gotham city nowhere else just gotham spider-man he lives in the bronx he's 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 a bronx you know what i mean like these are small areas that these superheroes protect they're not out there like protecting the world yeah i know spider-man was in marvel and then the marvel universe shifted to the whole planet blah, blah blah i get it but the, the real, the heart of these characters come from these cities that they, they belong to, you know? And so with Superman, yeah, he's mostly Metropolis. Well, it, it's in America. In America. US, and, yeah. and and if he stands for the American way, then yes, I, I chalk yeah. that up as all of USA because he did save California yeah. and New Jersey. I get that. I, I like that. And to this day, like, I, I don't think they should should change the moniker truth justice yeah. in the american way because it, it, regardless it doesn't make any less special the character yeah he, like telling me someone who lives in france is like oh i wish i wish superman was my hero in france no they they like superman because he's superman yeah but it's it, but it's the world we live in is that you can only identify with someone if they are your your race or your gender and, and that, we know that's not true though. but but, the, but that's kind of what like sometimes the mainstream media or yes. hollywood these that's shows what they want us to are think, telling yeah. you and like yeah. no representation is not necessarily that because why can't you as a, a little girl draw inspiration from superman or you as a little boy draw inspiration from wonder woman or even like someone like lois lane like I think yeah. they can relate to anybody, and this is why these characters continue to stand the test of time. That it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what their color is or their gender, that's right, or what country they come from, is that they that they symbolize something more than what that is. That's right. Very well said. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, okay, so that's pretty much the end of the film. That is. I really, really enjoyed the film. I thought it was great. Um, actually, I I'm kind of looking to watch it again here soon because I just I. Really really loved it and i think it's worth watching and and i actually do prefer this like christopher reeve to me is superman um he is the greatest and uh i'll say henry cavill is a very close second he's done great um i just wish that they could maybe give him a better story they need to to get behind henry cavill and they have to give him the right story yeah something it doesn't have to be similar to this but it has it has the essence of what christopher reeve had yeah with superman and you're right when you think of Superman, especially live action, is Christopher Reeve. That will always be the benchmark. Yep. Because he encapsulates it. He does. And the thing is, even more, Christopher Reeve actually transcended that because what happened to him in that horrific ac- horsing accident. Yes. Man, that you you actually realize this guy is super. I know. Like, just yeah. what he did with the situation and what he inspired. Yeah, that kind of like, I don't know, like, yeah, like, I wasn't a, a huge um, comic book hero person like you were but it still kind of hit me hard when i heard that christopher reeve had that accident i don't know i was just like i felt really sad that that had happened to him it is really sad that it happened to him like look at like <laughs> you obviously people can't see but i have a couple graphic novels here and if you look at the image of that doesn't it look like christopher reeve in 100%, Secret Origins? 100 and these are these are ones i have I've never read these but like just the image so what i'm what i'm saying is is that 
Christopher Reeve, his image of Superman has transcended even the person himself. Yeah. And it was horrific. And it is sad to even like talk about it because it'd be nice to the, the person to still be alive today and to hear him it talk about Superman. Because I think it'd be very interesting in today's world hearing Christopher Reeve's take on Superman. I'd yep. love to hear it. Yep. Yep. Me too. Um, okay. So with the, uh, with the ending of the movie, um, do you have anything extra you want to add or about the film? I just want to say that this is a must watch if you're uh, a comic book fan or you're a fan of fantasy. And, but even if you're a fan of like good hearted, inspirational material, Superman inspires you. And it's just a fun movie. It's 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 filled with nostalgia. And uh, but as an adult, like this is one of those movies, I don't think Till the day I die, I could probably still go back and watch this movie and get something out of it. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. Why don't we get into some trivia first, and oh. then uh, we'll rate the film? Yeah, do yeah. Do okay, some so I got a couple little trivia. So uh, to obtain the the musculature to convincingly play Superman, Christopher Reeve underwent a bodybuilding regime supervised by David Prowse. The man who played Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy. That's right. So that was a cool little uh, tidbit that I Very that cool. I learned. Uh, another one, uh, Richard Donner was disgusted that production designer John Barry and cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth received no recognition from the Academy for their work on this film. He was particularly aggrieved that one of the nominees for Best Art Direction was California Suite in 1978, which merely duplicated an existing hotel while Barry created an entire fictional city and a fortress in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, something went awry there because, I mean, that's terrible. Like, I, I, Obviously, I, I would not know of the time of 1978. I was only two years old, so I, I don't know what happened there. But but if that's true, like that's really, really sad to know. And also another another piece of trivia... Is it is actually amazing that this film turned out as good as it did because this film had tons of production issues. They they had the time frame of getting done, the effects. Also, they had to actually because they were filming two movies in one, they had to kind of refocus to just finishing the first part of the series. And also, there was lots of tensions between the producers and Richard Donner, where after the movie was released, they eventually fired Richard Donner, and that's why they brought in another director to finish off Superman 2. Okay. It's amazing that this film is yeah. as good as it is, but sometimes you hear a lot of these films that have had these nightmare productions and people not getting along they turn out to be great movies yeah. so it kind of shows to you that the right talent and the drive to get it done even when it's plagued by yeah uh, and i think one thing a person could take out of that that in life you know when you have like obstacles or things don't work your way you can still find you know good out of it yep you can turn a, a, a bad into a positive yeah and you feel better for it yeah. yeah yeah so definitely i thought i'd point that out that if you go watch on any of the extras on superman on your dvds or blu-rays or anything like that where you see on youtube yeah you can find a lot of this stuff this was a tough film to make just just like star wars yep yeah this was great i really enjoyed watching it i actually can't wait to watch it again. yeah no and then yeah. uh, even like the sequels like I like watching both Superman 2. I, I like the Richard Donner cut, I, which I recommend. Have you ever watched the Richard Donner cut? Probably not. Well, watch the Richard Donner cut. We, we may talk about that. <laughs> and uh, there's also the other Superman 2. And I, I think they both are fun to watch. Okay. So I'd recommend watching those kind of back to back. And then you can kind of compare the differences, what was kept, yeah. what wasn't. Because actually, like Gene Hackman and even Margot Kidder, because if you realize why Lois Lane in Superman 3 had such a small role, because uh, Warner Brothers production crew, I think was the, the Selkines, Iliad, there the, the was like a, a father and son kind of uh, producing team that did it. Okay. But anyways, they were at odds with Richard Donner. Both Gene Hackman and Margot Kidder, because they were loyal to Richard Donner, like quit the production. And you can see actually a lot of scenes of Lex Luthor are just stand in. Okay. So he didn't film any extra stuff, especially for the Richard Lesser or whatever okay. or Superman. So yeah. Yeah. And then Margot Kidder, she was contractedly obligated to be in the Superman like three, but they basically wrote her character out. Really? Okay. Because yeah. if she shows up in the beginning, you don't see her to the end. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So 
uh, a little unfortunate, and I think there was other things, but kind of kind of interesting. Okay, but that was a great conversation. It was a great conversation, but we should do our rating system. Yes, let's rate it. How about how many Otis candy apples? Ah, yes. <laughs> okay, that sounds better. How many Otis candy apples? <laughs> let's see that. Let's see that. I, I'm gonna basically forego the the special effects just because of the time, and I'm gonna base this straight off of story and characterization of the characters. And I think this is like a solid. I want to say eight candy apples. I just think it's great. The characters were great. We spent a lot of time with the characters. Even the characters that we didn't spend a lot of time with, I felt connected to them. And I thought that showed in this in this film. And uh, that's why I'm giving it a, a really good, really good review. Okay. Well, I'm going to give nine Otis Ooh. candy apples in this one. This is just, is it a perfect film? No. No. But it's a perfect superhero film. It is it, really good. It's a perfect film, like, you know, you can watch with the family. It's a perfect yep. film if you are a comic book fan, or even if you're not. And this is why I give it such a high rating. It mm -hmm. is it is the benchmark to, if it wasn't for Superman, there'd be no Batman 89. There there would be no X-Men. There would be no probably Marvel. Probably not. This is, yeah, this is probably the, the godfather of... This is. Yeah, of superhero films. Yeah. It really is. And like it says, it, it makes you believe a person can fly. Mm -hmm. Again, this was fun. We originally were going to have a special guest, but unfortunately uh, scheduling uh, kind of prevented us from having that. But we hope to have this individual join us on another podcast. We will. Yeah. But uh, we, we uh, went ahead as it was anyways. That's right. I had a good time. Okay. Well, let's fly out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Son of a bitch. Thank you for listening to the Turk and Raz podcast. You can catch us wherever you get your podcasts, such as Google, Spotify, Podbean, Audible, Amazon Music, YouTube, and Odyssey. Thanks for listening.